the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good morning. Although it's a four-hour schedule, we've got a, a lot a lot to talk about, so I want to get started relatively on time. I wish you um, a welcome. I am Leanna Mart. I'm Director of Jewish Outreach, and you can tell I'm hoarse. I don't know why. Whatever. On behalf of the Bronfman Center for Jewish Life, welcome again to the 92nd Street Y, and thank you for joining us uh, for this morning's Everett Institute. As many of you know, these intensive institutes, study institutes, are possible only because of the vision and the support of Mrs. and the late Henry Everett. May his memory be for a blessing. Um, but Mrs. Everett is here today. And I'd like to welcome and thank, of course, Mrs. Everett for sustaining this vision for over 20 years and uh, being such a great partner. Because nobody's here without Mrs. Everett, really. And so before I give the floor over to Dr. Reichman, I'd like to give you a little layout of the rest of uh, this season's Everett Institutes. And it's come to my attention that not everybody here has seen these. So if you'd like to get a more detailed outline of what the, inst what the season is looking like, um, I have some here and there are more in the lobby. There are three more, um, but they're wonderful. So spread the word. Um, in March, prominent ethnomusicologist, Dr. Marsha Brian Edelman will be here. She's going to be guiding us through a musical tour, a musical journey of Jewish history. Um, it, there will be actual music. We'll be listening to music as well as learning the history of it all. After Passover in April, Rabbi Gordon Tucker will be bringing us Abraham Joshua Heschel's philosophy on the rabbi's God and truth. And finally in April, Rabbi Mordechai Gaffney will be bringing us a fascinating look at the phenomenon of Israelis searching for spirituality in Tibetan Buddhism and the comparison a discussion in the, and his discussion initiated by the Dalai Lama comparing Jewish and Buddhist perspectives. Please consider joining us for the rest or one or all of these seas of the season's institutes. They're fabulous. Finally, um, this week we've got a couple of amazing things happening. This Tuesday, Rabbi Shefa Gold will be coming in from New Mexico and leading us in an interactive evening of Jewish chanting um, based on uh, both liturgical and biblical uh, works. It will be interactive if you enjoy singing yourself, if you enjoy chanting. Um, it will be a pretty special event. On Wednesday, the next day, the 25th, Rabbi Adin Steinsaltz will be here. The man Time Magazine calls a one in a millennium scholar, and he's going to be talking on rethinking Jewish identity. And then in February, there's some postcards in the back. We're going to be kicking off a new Friday night lectures in L'Chaim series with author and Tikkun Magazine editor Rabbi Michael Lerner. His talk will be on the left hand of God. It will offer a blueprint for how the Democratic Party may effectively challenge the right wing and win the White House in Congress. The lecture series will also include um, already signed copy of the book and refreshments not dissimilar to this. Anyway, more information on all of this is on the website and in our literature. So this morning, a brief review of our format. We'll be going in three sections of about an hour and 10, hour and 15 minutes with a break in between for a restroom or a coffee. Um, plenty of opportunity for questions throughout. Yes? Good. So now, for this morning's distinguished speaker. Edward Reichman is here, and he's an assistant professor of an emergency medicine at Montefiore Medical Center, an assistant professor of philosophy and history of medicine at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine of Yeshiva University. He received his rabbinic ordination also from the Rabbi Isaac Elchanan Theological Seminary of Yeshiva University, writes and lectures widely in the field of medical Jewish ethics. He's the recipient of a Kornfeld Foundation Fellowship and the Rubenstein Prize in Medical Ethics, and is a member of the medical board of the New York Organ Donor Network, and his research is devoted to the interface of medical history and Jewish law, what he'll be speaking about this morning. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rabbi Edward Reichman. Thank you very much, uh, Leanna, uh, both for the, uh, for the introduction and for your uh, efforts in coordinating uh, this morning's event. 
Um, I'm truly delighted and honored to be here. I've followed over the years the uh, speakers at the Everett Institute, and I am humbled and honored to be a part of that uh, illustrious group. And I, uh, I join in in thanking uh, Mrs. Everett and the late uh, Mr. Everett for really what has been an extraordinary contribution to Jewish education for, for many, many years and will, God willing, continue to be so uh, for years into the future. Um, they tell the story of a, uh, of a rabbi who was giving a lecture. And in the middle of his lecture, one of the congregants in the front row stood up and exited the hallway. Uh, and the rabbi was very offended at the time, but, but he didn't say anything. And uh, a couple days later, he happened upon this fellow in the street, and he said to him, Sir, why is it that you left my lecture in the middle? So the man said, Well, rabbi, I needed to take a haircut. So he said, Why didn't you take a haircut before the lecture? He said, Rabbi, I didn't need a haircut before the lecture. <laughs> And now, in order for us to cover the entire field of Jewish medical ethics, we would indeed have to stay here until our hair will grow long. But in this uh, wonderful opportunity this morning, our hair will grow a little bit long. We have a number of hours together uh, to discuss a number of different issues. Uh, just as far as, uh, as the layout of this, uh, this morning's uh, uh, discussions will be, uh, first of all, we will be divided into three sections. I've divided it into the present, the, uh, I'm sorry, the past, the present, and the future. And uh, for our first session, we'll be discussing medical historical chapters from the past, some absolutely fascinating chapters, which I, I trust you'll find as fascinating as I do. Uh, for the middle section, we'll be talking about issues of the present, primarily organ donation, living organ donation, and uh, organ donation after life, cadaveric organ donation. Uh, and I encourage you, if you have questions uh, on other issues, we can also entertain those, those uh, questions in the question and answer periods. Uh, and the third section will be issues of genetics, and in particular, uh, stem cell research as we look forward into the future. Um, also, I just want to mention, um, I assume I hope everyone has a handout. You will see that there is Hebrew text in the handout. Fear not. All Hebrew will be translated and discussed. So the objective is, uh, is for you to see that the original texts, which we are going to discuss today, uh, to give us a flavor of the origins of the, uh, of the learning. Um, to begin our historical discussion, as we turn the page to the, uh, the first text page. Does anyone, by the way, know where the uh, illustration from the cover uh, derives from? If not, we'll discuss it in a few moments in the course of this morning's, uh, in the course of this morning's talk. We begin our discussion in the Middle Ages. And the Bible tells us in, the, uh, in Leviticus, in the book of uh, Leviticus or Vayikra, says, Vayedaber Hashem el Moshe Limor, Hash, uh, um, Hashem discusses or talks to Moses and says to him, Isha ki tazria, when a woman gives forth a zera, v'yolda zachor, and, she, and gives birth to a male child. Now the commentators on this particular passage, which we'll read in about a, a few months, I think, in the, uh, in the cycle of the Torah reading, made the following discussions, and, uh, and I read for you in your text, under the seven-chambered uterus. Isha ki tazria, when a woman gives forth zera. Now, does anyone know what, what zera means, the Hebrew word zera? Seed. seed, zera means seed. When a woman gives forth seed. So in this particular passage, it was an opportunity for the rabbis to discuss theories of reproductive physiology and reproductive embryology at different stages throughout history. So we have here a text from the Middle Ages, from the 1200s, discussing the following fascinating theory. Isha ki tazria, ki tazria, and I'm skipping to the uh, underlined section for those of you who wish to follow along in the text. V'yesh omrim shematsu b'sefer hateva, and some say that they have found in one of the scientific books, again keep in mind here that this is the, uh, the Middle Ages, sh'yesh b'isha shiva nekavim, that a woman's uterus has seven chambers. Shloshim yamin, three on the right, ushloshim yismol, and three on the left, ve'echad be'emtza, and one in the middle. Im nichnas hazera be'osan shel yamin, if the reproductive seed of the man enters the three chambers on the right of this uterus, teleid zachar, she will give birth to a male child. Ve'im be'shel smol, and if the seed, reproductive seed of the man enters the three left chambers of the uterus, she will give birth to a female child. And what do you think it will be if it enters the center chamber? 
either the Hebrew term is tumtum or adrogonus, which is either a hermaphrodite, which is a combination of male and female, or tumtum, which is neither male nor female. And the medical term we use for that today is ambiguous genitalia. Now, this particular theory only found its expression in the Middle Ages. And it's quite fascinating, and we'll realize by the end, hopefully, of our first session why that is, uh, as we discuss in, in a few moments the history of anatomical dissection and the history of the understanding of the human body. And it's also expressed in another commentary from the Middle Ages, the Paneach Raza, which is underneath, uh, and in essence repeats the same, uh, the same belief. And if you look on your handout, you'll actually see some illustrations of the seven-chambered uterus from the Middle Ages. This one on the left-hand corner, it looks a little bit like the NBC peacock. It is not. It is actually an illustration from the, of the seven-chambered uterus from the, 12th, uh, from the 13th century. And likewise, in the upper right-hand corner, there's also an illustration from the Middle Ages of this seven-chambered uterus. The, the, um, what you see in your handout, under, uh, there's between two illustrations on the right side, there's a little circle which is entitled Sefer Hagan, is from the 11th century, is another rabbinic commentary. Uh, and that commentary actually surprisingly, although I miniaturized it just a little bit, just a little bit, it's actually a, a passage from a manuscript which still remains in manuscript, still hasn't been published. This is a copy of the original manuscript which was written in hand. I could not read it without a microscope. The, the original manuscript, and this is probably the very earliest reference to this, uh, this theory of the seven-chambered uterus. Now, if you look in the Talmud, for example, and just to give some historical context, the Talmud is from the fifth century, was redacted in the fifth century of the Common Era, you will see no mention of the seven-chambered uterus at all. Uh, and it's interesting because even in the history of science and medicine, there is no reference to it, but in the Middle Ages, this theory evolved of the seven-chambered uterus. It was so, it was so, I'm sorry, go ahead. Excellent question. We'll talk about it in a minute. There, are there genuinely seven chambers? Perhaps there were seven chambers in the uterus back in the Middle Ages, and there aren't today. Um, but the answer to that is philosophy and medicine were very integrally related at that time. They didn't do anatomical dissection to the extent that we would imagine. Like today, if you told someone there were seven chambers in the uterus, they'll say, well, just open up the human body. You'd never see it. And even t today, I think in the South Street Seaport, there is an exhibit now uh, which is sort of a uh, borrowing of the concept of another exhibit which is touring the world called Body Worlds, uh, which hasn't quite made it to New York, and I'm curious why I never made it to New York, but I think currently it's in Philadelphia, uh, which is a, an extraordinary exhibit of dissection of the human body and, and actual human specimens preserved in, and dissected in, in unique ways. And it's actually raised controversy both in Europe and in the United States everywhere it's traveled. But you know, you'd say just go to the museum, you'd see there's no seven chambers in the uterus, so how is it possible that they had these interesting anatomical notions in times prior to our own. So we'll, we'll get to that in more detail as we do the, the section related to specifically anatomy, which we'll do in a, in a short period of time. Um, but to give you an idea of how prevalent the seven-chambered uterus, uterus was, none other than Leonardo da Vinci drew seven chambers to the woman's uterus. And if you go to a Westminster, uh, not Westminster Abbey, um, another one of the castles, the name eludes me right now, not in London, but outside London, uh, Windsor, yes, thank you very much. Windsor, where the, uh, the anatomical illustrations of Leonardo da Vinci are housed, you will see that the illustration of the female uterus has seven chambers, to give you an idea of how prevalent and how pervasive this notion of the seven chambered was. So you see here that it was also known, it was so prevalent, by the way, that if you went to medical school in the Middle Ages, this was the doctrine of anatomy that you learned. It wasn't presented as a theory, it was presented as fact. Yes. We'll, we'll discuss, the question was, is this the theory that Maimonides operated under? Would, have not, would it not have gone back to Galen and Hippocrates? So the answer is, Maimonides actually does not have a discussion of the, of the uh, eight-chambered uterus, even though he's roughly contemporary with these sources. As far as what Galen and Hippocrates said, no, Galen and Hippocrates did not discuss the seven-chambered uterus. It was a creation of the Middle Ages. And the earliest scientific source we have of this theory is uh, a, a scientist or physician whose name was Michael uh, Scotus. And he was, uh, he, he devised this theory probably in the 12th, 11th century, 11th, 12th century. 
it would be preceding Maimonides. Now, he doesn't discuss it specifically. I don't know if he would have adopted it. He didn't write any anatomical texts. He wrote many medical texts, but no text on anatomy. And he also wrote, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, you mentioned Galen. He wrote a, a commentary on the works of Galen, who preceded him by over a millennium. Um, so this theory, uh, and what's interesting also, actually uh, relevant to the, to the uh, portion of the Torah that we read uh, um, yesterday, um, beginning of Exodus, uh, Shemos, there is, a, uh, there is a phrase in the Torah that says, and the children of Israel, the Hebrew is, paru vayishritzu vayirbu vayatzmu od ma'od, which basically means they proliferated, they had many children. And the Midrash says that the, uh, they have a question, they have a, a serious uh, um, a pr demographical question in the, in, the, in the Bible. They came down with 70 people to Egypt and they left with hundreds of thousands of people. How is it possible that they had such a proliferation of people in a relatively short period of time? So the Midrash says that the women in Egypt gave birth to sex tuplets at a time. Sex tuplets, six at a time. And it's based on this uh, phrase in the in the Bible because there there are seven there are six verbs paru vayishritzu vayirbu vayatzmu bimod maod there's six so there's a, a linkage to the text that the women gave birth to six at a time so some commentaries at the time that this seven chambered uterus theory was prevalent have interpreted this midrash in a new way by saying the women could theoretically have given birth to seven at a time because after all they had seven chambers in the uterus the blessing was they only gave birth to six because had they given birth to seven, they would have, that center chamber would have been either a hermaphrodite or, or a child with ambiguous genitalia, which would have been a cursed child and not a child that would have been appropriate to, uh, to give birth to. So here what we have, in the demonstration here, the illustration here really, is that the rabbis were very uh, contemporary in their understanding of medicine. This wasn't necessarily a rabbinic theory. It was a prevalent secular theory, which everybody accepted as doctrine and as fact, and it was integrated even to the rabbinic teachings of that time. As we move on to the next, uh, oh, by the way, this theory was disproved uh, in the 1500s and 1600s, and the person who was uh, believed to have disproved it was an a, a anatomist by the name of Berengario de Carpi, and I apologize, I don't have the illustration, um, but the illustration is, um, is a woman who, who's anatomically exposed, whose uterus is visible and seen, and whose leg is standing on the old doctrine of the seven-chambered uterus, as if to illustrate you know, we now know better. Uh, we have learned that the uterus really doesn't have seven chambers, and as you can see in the illustration, the uterus only has uh, one chamber. We now move ahead from the Middle Ages into the 16th century to discuss a very fascinating chapter. And this text, comes from a, uh, the chief rabbi of Egypt in the 1600s, whose name was Rabbi David Ben Zimra. Uh, he practiced in Alexandria, in Cairo, for a, a long span of time, uh, apparently lived roughly a century, which is quite extraordinary for the time period that he lived in. And the question posed to him was as follows. Sha'al to me many, I have been asked, please inform us of your opinion, on what basis do people today in the 16th century use this particular medicinal substance, which is called mumia? And they use it even for non-serious conditions, and they use it for, for their benefit. And furthermore, they trade in this particular substance. So what is the big deal? What's the problem with this unique substance? The problem with this substance, mumia, is that it derives from the human corpse. This was a medicinal substance used in the 16th century, which was derived from the human corpse. So what's the problem from Jewish law? The problem is there are certain things which relate to the disposition of the corpse in Jewish law. One is not allowed to desecrate the human corpse. One is not allowed to derive benefit from the human corpse. One has an obligation to bury the human corpse. So how do we, how do we uh, jive these two things with the rabbinic uh, concerns about the disposition of the human body with this use of the, of the corpse for medicinal purposes? Now, before we discuss the answer of Rav David Ben Zimra, which is a very important answer methodologically also 
the the approach to his answer is one that will be applied and has been applied in in all aspects of Jewish law and medicine. Let us uh, take a, a pause and discuss the history of this very unique substance called mumia. Fascinating history. If you look at the um, antique, uh, times of antiquity, you'll see that Dioscorides, for example, and others like him who lived in roughly the first century, the second century of the Common Era, who compiled all medicinal substances of that period, list among their medicinal substances a substance called mum or mumia. This particular substance at that period of time was derived from the mountains and it was an asphalt or bituminous-like substance, which was thick, tarry black substance. And according to his account and many others' accounts, it was a virtual panacea of medical care. It was used, it was ingested, it was used as a salve, it was uh, for stomach ailments, for headaches, for, uh, for arthritis, a whole host of things. Um, and it was very commonly used in antiquity and actually derived from modern day uh, areas of modern day Iran and, uh, and also around the areas of the Dead Sea. Not to be confused with the black uh, mud that people put on their faces in the Dead Sea today. That's a different, uh, different black substance. Um, but it was a very commonly used substance. And it was so commonly used and thought to have such tremendous medicinal value that the Egyptians co-opted this material in the embalming of their bodies. So they believed if it had such great medicinal value in, the, in, the, uh, in this life, surely it would have great medicinal value in the, uh, in the afterlife. So they embalmed all their mummies with this black substance. And to this very day, if you've ever had an opportunity to go see mummies, uh, mummy exhibits throughout the world, there's one here at the Metropolitan Museum. There is in the British Museum in London. There is in Northern Italy in the city of Turin. There's one of the uh, one of the best and uh, most extensive uh, Egyptology exhibits, where you have mummies. And when the mummies are unraveled, which occasionally you'll see, you'll notice that they are black. The reason they are black is not because of the years of desiccation. It's because they are embalmed in this substance called mum or mumia, which is pitch black. So what happened is a fascinating transference, which took place over a number of centuries. There was a transference from the medicinal value of this black mineral, which was mined, to the actual body, which was embalmed with the mineral, to the extent that the very body itself was called mummy. And the etymology of mummy derives from this mum or mumia substance with which, within which it was embalmed. And not only was there a transference of the name, there was a transference of the medicinal value so that people thought they forgot that it originally came from, uh, from the mountains and it was a mineral. They actually took parts of the Egyptian mummies, we're talking in the Middle Ages now, and ingested those parts of the mummy and used those parts of the mummy as a salve in order to treat themselves. And that's where we were. That's the question. And who do you think, by the way, was involved heavily in the trade of Egyptian mummies at that time? The Jews. The Jews were big traders in the Mid-East in the Mid East and the Near East. And they used to farm out this mummy stuff substance all over the world. And you can see on your handout, on the bottom left-hand corner, is a container labeled Mumia Alexandria. Mumia which derived from the city of Alexandria. <laughs> And this was a very commonly uh, prescribed substance, and it was also traded heavily by the Jews in that period of time in Egypt. So you can well imagine in the congregation of David ben Zimra, he had a number of people who were not only using this substance freely, but who also were trading in this substance. So hence the question was posed to him, Rabbi, we have a serious problem here. We have people in our community that are using a substance derived from the human corpse. And not only that, they're trading in the substance. Are they allowed to derive benefit from this kind of thing or are they not allowed to derive benefit from this kind of thing? It seems like it's, 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 against, uh, it's against Jewish law. So how did Rabbi David Ben Zimra answer this question? The answer to this question is the the methodology of the answer to this question is a methodology which is employed and continues to be employed in all issues of halacha in general, but very specifically in medicine and halacha. In order to answer the question, he educated himself. He went to the local pharmacist and he said, how do you make this substance from the harvesting from the mummy until the time that it shows up on your shelf in this container called Mummy Alexandria? How do you make it? 
So the pharmacist or the physicians told him, well, first we extract it from the corpse, then we pulverize it, then we add cinnamon, then we add myrrh, then we add honey, and then uh, there's a whole bunch of processing before it reaches the, uh, the pharmacist's shelf. So based on that understanding, Rabbi David Ben Zimra um, made his decision. And his decision was that being that this substance is used for medicinal purposes, and furthermore, the substance is so far removed from the original body that it was derived from, it would be permitted not only to use it as a salve, but even to ingest the substance. However, if one is a Kohen of the priestly tribe, and there is a prohibition for the priestly tribe to come in contact with the corpse, and there is a requisite volume that, is, that, that needs to be met in order for the Kohen to, uh, to be prohibited from coming in contact. And if that requisite volume is met in that substance of, of mumia, then the Kohen would be prohibited from exposing himself to this particular substance. So here we have a prototype for answering medical halachic questions. Understand the science, understand the medicine. Once you've integrated that, then you can apply the law accordingly. Yes. I'll give, you, I'll give you the postscript in a moment. The question was, was there any, any scientific studies? Did it do any benefit? Uh, the 1500s was a period prior to academic and rigorous scientific study. Uh, rigorous scientific study, the kind of which you read today in medical journals, is really a product of the, uh, the 1700s and the 1800s. There were, however, detractors of this particular substance. A very famous French surgeon who's a famous figure in the history of, uh, of medicine, Ambrose Paré, who uh, is known more for his his, uh, his impact on wound healing, wrote an entire treatise on the use of mumia and claimed that it was a useless substance. Uh, so there was, there was indeed debate, uh, but, there, but, uh, but there were people who, uh, who believed that it had tremendous medicinal value. And just to complete the chapter and actually bring it up to the 21st century, um, what happened to the use of mumia, the, medic the, uh, the extract from the, from the corpses? We have, this is one, one source from the Radbaz, Rabbi David Ben Zimra. There are a handful of rabbinic sources in this period of the Middle Ages that discuss this issue um, and, and argue back and forth about whether it is indeed permitted, whether it is forbidden to use this kind of substance. But the reason it fell into disuse was because of a scandal. There was a scandal in the mummy trade. What was the scandal in the mummy trade? There was a disgruntled employee of one of the factories. Uh, and uh, he was not happy with his, uh, with his factory owner. And he also observed that his factory owner had a problem. Uh, I mean, imagine you're in the mummy trade. How many ancient Egyptian mummies are you going to get? So there was a, a tremendous uh, demand and very little supply. So what some practitioners of the mummy trade did is they were unable to obtain the ancient mummies, so they took recently deceased bodies, allowed them to desiccate in the African sands of uh, the African deserts, and they used extracts from those and pawned it off as, as, uh, as mummy. Hence you have, on the lower right-hand corner, a container that's labeled mumia ver, which means genuine certified mummy, not to be confused with the fraudulent mummy, which was being pawned off in, in other places. Now, it doesn't have the OU or the Chafke or any uh, supervision on it, but I suspect that had it been around at that time, you would indeed see it. Yes? Was mummy, was that a, a legal or an illegal business? The question was, was it a legal or an illegal business? It was generally not governed by, by the law. It was a practice which had continued for you know, roughly a century or two. It became heavily taxed. Even after this, it remained heavily legal. This person, by the way, who was a disgruntled employee, he went to the government and informed that they were using fraudulent mummies. They didn't ban the practice of the mummy trade. They simply regulated it and imposed tremendous taxes on it. And once they imposed the tremendous tax on the mummy trade, then the mummy trade dissipated very shortly thereafter. Um, so no double blind studies <laughs> So let me, let me uh, give you a postscript to the mummy trade. So I, so in, uh, I once gave a lecture and discussed this mummy trade in uh, Jacksonville in Florida. And a woman came up to me afterwards. And she said, I am from Uzbekistan. And we, to this very day, have a substance in Uzbekistan which is called mumia. And she actually sent me these thick uh, pitch black tablets 
in the same tradition as the ancient mum mummy. And she said to me, she came with her husband to Jacksonville. He was suffering from an undiagnosed problem. Went to many doctors in the United States. Nobody was able to cure the problem. And, he, uh, and they sent away to their native country, Uzbekistan, for this mumia. He started taking the mumia, and lo and behold, he was cured. So she asked me to market this in the United States, <laughs> to do double-blind trials, <laughs> and to try and make us both rich off the, uh, off the mumia substance. But you see, the, the, this mumia is literally thousands of years old, and it's still, uh, it's still perpetuated to this very day in not, not a dissimilar fashion from the origin. So, so ends the chapter of Mumia as we turn the page to the anatomy of halacha. What actually is this substance? It is, uh, it's a mineral substance, a black, uh, black mineral, asphalt, uh, calcium, uh, phosphate, I mean, it's a whole host of, uh, uh, of, of mineral substances. Yes? Uh -huh. You could say it's not a part of it, I would say. Well, if, if, if the permission is to use it for medicinal purposes, that even if you ingest it, or even if you put it on the skin, it becomes integrated. Pikuach nefesh, nefesh, true pikuach nefesh, which we'll discuss actually in this exact uh, responsum now, would definitely allow, uh, allow those. And, uh, and actually, when we discuss organ transplants, which is the ultimate of integration of, of organs, another organ into your body, uh, that'll, be a related, uh, that'll be a related issue too. And that we'll discuss in the, in the present. We're still, we still haven't reached the present, yes. Uh, today, all the pharmaceutical companies, as they advertise, will tell you that side effects. Do they have... <laughs> uh, side effect profiles. <laughs> Yeah, uh, the, the truth is they probably did not have, uh, did not print the side effect uh, profile with, uh, with these medicinal uh, things. And, and uh, you know, the, the Middle Ages was a different period of understanding of medicine, and it, it'll, it interrelates also with what we're going to talk about now, the whole understanding of the human body. I mean, in the previous centuries, their understanding of medicine was not an organ-based uh, system of understanding as we now know today. It was a, uh, a belief that there were four humors in the body. Um, the blood, the phlegm, um, and the bile, and, uh, and disease was thought to be due to an imbalance of these four humors, and, uh, and hence they, uh, they had purging, enemas, and bloodletting, and all these kinds of things were, uh, I'm sorry? We still do. Right, right, we still do to, to, a very, to a very extent. They did understand the placebo effect, but not in a, in a rigorous academic fashion. They understood that giving people medicine, even though they wouldn't necessarily need it, would be of some of some help and some value to them. But not not definitely not to the extent that we've uh, we've explored it in an academic fashion in the in the 21st century. So we now come to the 18th century with the following question, which remains a very seminal question in uh, in Jewish law to this very day. And the question was posed to Rabbi Yechezkel Landau, who is known by the pseudonym Noda Bihuda, which was the name of his work, his classic work of questions and answers or responsa, as was the practice and remains the practice in, uh, in, in Jewish literature. So the question posed to him, he was a prominent figure in the city of Prague, and as you'll see, people sent questions to him from all over the world, and this was one such question. The question is, and I'm reading from the second line after the two dots, Regarding the question which came to me from the prominent city of London, regarding a particular incident which occurred there, regarding someone who fell ill with a particular medical condition called Evan Bikiso. Uh, now, is there anyone here who's, who's literate in Hebrew who could, who could hazard a guess what Evan Bikiso might mean? A stone, so literally translated, it means a stone in his pocket. Exactly. So what would a stone in his pocket be in the human body? So one would think gallstones or possibly kidney stones. And we'll see in a, in a short while what it must have been by, by virtue of the, uh, of the context, of the historical context. So this person fell ill with this particular medical condition. And what did the doctors do? The rofim, the physicians, they, they operated, as was their practice for this particular medical condition. Velo also lo trufa umes, and tragically they were unsuccessful, and the patient died as a result. 
ונשאלו שם חכמי העיר, and the sages of London were asked, אם מותר לחתוך בגוף המס במקום הזה, can we perform an autopsy on this individual to determine the cause of death? כדי להסלמד מזה בהנהגת הרופאים מכאן ולהבא. Can we learn from this autopsy physicians who will in the future address this particular medical condition? Is that something that we are allowed to do or not allowed to do? Now we just discussed in our in our mumia chapter that there are issues about the, the, the body after one dies. You can't desecrate the body. You can't uh, derive benefit from the body. You have to bury the body. So could it be perhaps that an autopsy would be pikuach nefesh, would be something that would save a human life, and therefore we can justify violating these prohibitions, or perhaps not? And that was the question posed to the Nodebihudi, yes? Well, where was that concept in relation to the rest of the medical world, the uh, autopsy? Was the rest of the world doing autopsies at that time? So the question is, was the rest of the world doing aut autopsies at that time? And that is exactly the question I want to address right now. In the history of rabbinic literature, this is the very first responsum that addresses the issue of the autopsy of the human body. So I want to ask, why is it that it's only in the 1700s that you have somebody talking about human autopsy? Why didn't Maimonides, who lived in the 1200s, 1100s, 1200s, why didn't he talk about autopsy? He was not only a great uh, Talmudic scholar and prolific uh, rabbinic author, he was a practicing physician. So shouldn't he, of all people, discuss the issue of autopsy of the human body and the concern about the uh, violation of Jewish law? What about uh, the, the great text in the 1500s called the Shulchan Aruch, which is the, the, the major code of Jewish law, which covers all aspects from, from birth to death and thereafter, which is still used this very day for adjudicating legal matters? Why is there no mention whatsoever of, of autopsy and the, and the prohibitions or concerns about anatomical dissection? They talk about uh, mourning practices, exhumation of the body, everything imaginable from, from the beginning of life to afterlife and burial practices, not a single mention about autopsy or anatomical dissection. So in order to answer that question, here too, we have to understand the historical context. And here we'll spend a few moments discussing, in, in brief obviously, the history of anatomical dissection and the understanding of human anatomy. And you can see this relates, this relates to the seven-chambered uterus which we talked about, uh, and it relates to many issues and understanding of texts that precede the centuries that we are in now. If you go back to antiquity in the second, third century before the Common Era, there was a school of anatomical dissection in, coincidentally, the city of Alexandria, where the Radbaz was to practice some 1700, 1700 years later. That school, which was headed by a number of prominent uh, scientists at that time, Herophilus and Aristratus were the two uh, Greek uh, physicians who headed up that school, was a very prominent school of anatomical teaching. We don't have a single record from that school. No, no text from extant from that period. How do we know it existed? We know it existed from centuries later, people writing about that school. And that school, apparently, as we know from our texts now, uh, a number of people attended that school to learn anatomical dissection. They were, they were known for brain anatomy, for the spinal cord anatomy, uh, but that school only lasted about a century, a century and a half, and then closed down. After that school closed down, and it was still before the Common Era, there was not any systematic anatomical dissection of the human body until the times of the Renaissance. So we're talking about 15, 1600 years without systematic anatomical dissection. Now it doesn't mean they weren't doing any anatomical dissection. They were doing some. There would be an occasional dissection here and there uh, if a body washed up on the shore or if a, a, a criminal was sentenced to death. But even that would be somebody performing a dissection and holding a book, maybe one dissection a year, and uh, discussing the issues with the class, uh, the medical school class. Occasionally they would be able to see the body, but more often than not they wouldn't be able to see the body. Um, now someone mentioned Galen. Uh, Galen was one of the uh, more prominent figures in the history of medicine. Hippocrates. Uh, whom we all know of was, uh, and his works, by the way, were not the works of one author whose name was Hippocrates. They are generally, according to contemporary scholarship, uh, considered to be authored by many people, and we'll call it the School of Hippocrates, it was in the fifth century before the Common Era, and he was obviously one of the great contributors to the understanding of medicine, but he was superseded 
by Galen, who was in the first century of the Common Era. And to give him Jewish context, he was contemporary with Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, who was the person who redacted the text of the Mishnah. Uh, Galen wrote a tremendous number of medical works, which were used for well over a 1,000 years in the practice of, and, uh, and training of medicine. And even Galen, who was the definitive author of medicine, did not systematically perform dissection on the human body. Many of the anatomical discussions in Galen are derived from his dissection of animals. And they were erroneous, they were false, and there were errors which were perpetuated for over a thousand years because he was dissecting uh, primates and apes and gorillas instead of dissecting human beings. Now he was a uh, physician to the gladiators, so he learned a little cross-sectional anatomy. But even that was not in any systematic fashion. So when did this change? This changed in the period of the Renaissance. Uh, who is believed to have affected this change? Now, there, there are many people, obviously, who contribute to any major change like this, but the crowning glory of this change was considered to be a man by the name of Andreas Vesalius. Andreas Vesalius, who was a, uh, an anatomist in the 1600s and 16th century, published what is considered one of the classic works in the history of medicine and the history of man, and it's called The Fabric of the Human Body. And you have in your handout in the upper left-hand corner a, uh, a miniaturization of the front page of this work. And you can actually see in this uh, illustration, and the book itself is not an average size book. The book itself is probably about this big. And um, you can see the uh, Vesalius himself leaning over a body, performing a dissection, and showing people in this theater. And I say theater specifically theater, because at that time it was such a novelty and such interest in the rediscovery of the human body in this, in this newly detailed fashion that it was a theatrical event that not only did students attend, public figures attended, politicians attended, your average citizen attended, and even uh, Renaissance artists attended. And you can actually see this rediscovery of human anatomy as it's manifest in the art of the Renaissance. And if you've traveled, you don't need to travel to Italy. Obviously, you can see here in museums in New York, but it's, it's more, uh, more, more prominent in Italy. If you look at this, the Italian Renaissance sculpture, and keep in mind, Vesalius was in Italy. He's, he, he did his dissections in Italy. The sculpture has tremendous anatomical detail, which you don't find in previous, uh, previous sculptures. So you'll see every single vein and artery of the body delineated. You'll see every muscle fiber delineated in a way which you never saw before. And why is that? Because these artists actually attended dissections like the one that, uh, that, that Vesalius performed and learned their anatomy from the anatomy dissections and from the magnificent works which were being published at this time. <laughs> So it really was only in this time that it was reintroduced. Parenthetically, in this, the classic works of Vesalius, Vesalius um, translates the anatomical terms of the human body into a number of different languages. Uh, and they are translated into Latin, they are translated into Greek, and they are translated into Hebrew. You will find the Hebrew language in the anatomical works of Vesalius. And you may ask, why is Hebrew in the works of, uh, of Vesalius? So this will take us a little bit of field, but just briefly, it gives us an understanding of the integral part that Jews played in the transmission of medical knowledge throughout the centuries. Jews were not only practitioners of medicine, like Maimonides and others, but they were also translators of the ancient Greek medicine by virtue of their linguistic skills. And they were an integral part of the transmission of the ancient medicine into the period of the, of the Renaissance and beyond. And the Jews were thought to have such a, a, a tradition of medicine um, that even though in the Christian faith, uh, from already the 11th century, probably even earlier, there were, there were papal bulls which, uh, which uh, basically prohibited Christians from being treated by Jewish physicians. Uh, and they were continually uh, reaffirmed and reinforced throughout the, throughout the centuries. But despite the fact that they, they prohibited Jews from treating Christians, every single pope, and I don't think there's a single exception to this, had a Jewish physician on their staff. <laughs> and part of the reason is 
because they knew that the Jews were a direct link to the tradition of medicine. And I actually have at home a list of the popes and the physicians that served on their staff throughout the, uh, throughout the centuries that were, of Jewish, uh, that were of Jewish origin. So you can understand why it is that the Ma Maimonides, who was practicing in the 1200s, 1100s, did not discuss anatomical dissection because he didn't train with anatomical dissection. It wasn't an integral part of medical training at that time. Even in the early 1500s, when you had the period of uh, the Shulchan Aruch, it was only Vesalius' work only came out in 1543, and it's not like today where, uh, you know, Vesalius' work comes out, there's a review on the internet in five minutes after it's published. It, it took, you know, decades for this information to be disseminate, disseminated throughout Europe, if not centuries to be disseminated throughout Europe. So it was really only in the 1700s, 1600s, 1700s that, that anatomical dissection really became an integral part of training, and that is why the very first response that we have dealing with anatomical dissection is in this period by the No de Behuda by and before we get to the answer of his question, which we'll get to in a few moments, just to give you another fascinating insight into the period of the time now that dissection had become an integral part of training, we have a question which was posed in the middle of your page, Sheilas um, Yavitz. Yavitz is an acronym for Yaakov Emden Ben Tzvi. Uh, Jacob Emden was a very prominent figure in the in the 1700s, and uh, there's uh, historical uh, debates about uh, the inter interrelationship between Rav Yaakov Emden and Rav Yonason Ibeshitz, and uh, many histor fascinating historical discussions. He was he lived in Germany and was a very prominent rabbinic figure. And the following question was posed to him from the city of Göttingen. Now, Göttingen is in Germany. And the question posed to him was by a medical student, a Jewish religious medical student, who was in the University of Göttingen in Germany. And he had a medical halachic question, Jewish legal question. Now, what was his question that he sent to this very prominent figure at that time, Rabbi Jacob Emden? And he, he uh, we're not going to read through the whole text. It's a very beautiful, flowery text. Clearly, this was a bright medical student, very literate. Uh, the language that he writes in is really quite extraordinary. Not too many people at all in that period would have been able to write in such a flowery language. And literally every phrase is a reference to some biblical text. Uh, it should be footnoted. Even his discussions could be, uh, could be footnoted. Um, but if you skip to, the, um, to just a few lines from the bottom in the underlined section, it says, Anyone who chooses the profession of medicine, tzarich lil mod chachmas hanituach, has to learn an anatomy, an anatomical dissection. Upaamim b'shabbos, and sometimes on Shabbos, may misim es hakelev, they will take a dog and kill the dog and perform dissection on the dog. Im ein meis nachri muchan lifneim, if there is no corpse that they can obtain. And it was very difficult to obtain bodies for dissection in those days, and we'll talk in a minute about the history of, uh, of, of that, which is another truly fascinating history. It specifies a non-Jewish corpse. It says meis nachri, correct. And we'll talk actually a non -Jew, why specifically non-Jewish corpse, because he was obviously a religious Jew, and they didn't allow the Jewish bodies to be dissected. And we'll talk about that in just, in just a moment. Yes, you're absolutely correct. So, so he, this was a question poster of Jacob Emden, and Jacob Emden answered his question in a very lengthy, this is a small excerpt, it's about a 10, 15 page uh, response, and he used it as an opportunity to discuss not only issues of Shabbos, but issues of anatomical dissection, a whole, whole uh, lengthy discussion. And he allows him certain, with certain limitations to perform it, but uh, shouldn't be carrying anything on the Sabbath, it's prohibited according to Jewish law to carry things on Sabbath, um, and other types of issues. And the person who wrote this question, um, the last line, uh, bold-faced, so are the words of the person who prostrates himself on the, uh, on the wisdom of, uh, of medicine, Hatsair Binyamin Wolf Ginsburg, the, young, uh, the youthful young Binyamin Wolf Ginsburg. And we actually have another record of this particular student, Binyamin Wolf Ginsburg. We have a copy of the dissertation that he wrote to graduate the University of Göttingen in Germany. 
Now, it was practice and it remains practice in Europe more so than in the United States. To complete your medical degree, you not only had to go through your coursework and your, and your practical training, you had to write a dissertation. Now, in those days, not like today where people look on the internet and in five minutes they'll you know, put something together and, and get a dissertation. In those days, the dis often the dissertations that people wrote to receive their medical degree were, were foundational research for major changes and upheavals in medicine. I mean, these were highly intelligent, well-dedicated students who were writing wonderful dissertations. The topic of the dissertation from Benjamin Wolf Ginsburg was biblical and Talmudic medicine. And what he did is he went through bi the Bible and the Talmud, and he excerpted aspects of medicine found in these texts, and he wrote a dissertation on this topic of biblical and Talmudic medicine. And to our knowledge, he is the very first individual to collect the material from the Bible and the Talmud and in, in this fashion, and to write a treatise on biblical and Talmudic medicine. And you have in, the, in your handout the uh, translation of, this, uh, of, this, uh, of the front page of that work. Inaugural medical disputation on medicine from the Talmud to the consensus of the gracious medical factory, fa faculty under the chairmanship, etc., etc., um, by the author Benjamin Wolf Ginsberger. <clears throat> now, since that time, there have been many other um, contributions to the field of biblical and Talmudic medicine. Perhaps the most famous and still remains the most comprehensive was a work by Julius Preuss, uh, written in the early uh, 1900s. Uh, called, which was written in German, Biblical and Talmudic Medicine, a, an encyclopedic work uh, impossible to, uh, to recreate. One can only add to the work that he's done. One can't uh, supplant it or displace it. It's been translated into English by Dr. Fred Rosner. Um, he was also a prominent figure in the history of, uh, in, 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 in uh, Jewish uh, writings, and also he, his medical training, for those of you who are in the medical field, was under Rudolf uh, Virchow, or Virchow, who is a, a giant in the f history of medicine, a, uh, a pathologist in Germany, after whom uh, a number of, uh, of conditions in the body have been named. And he received his medical training from, uh, from one of the greats. Um, now, we had asked the question, what is it that this Choli Ho'evin Bekiso was? What was this particular medical condition? And someone said, a, a stone in the pocket. And it is a stone in the pocket, but which pocket was it? And uh, perhaps we have other discussions of this similar kind of condition. So this pocket that it was was not the gallbladder. Now, why was it not the gallbladder? Because based on the history of medicine, remember, they only started doing anatomical dissection in the times of the Renaissance. They didn't even know about the existence of a gallbladder till about the 1400s let alone gallstones, and they weren't operating on gallstones until the mid-1800s. So what stone could it have been? There's only one stone it could have been. And it's not even a kidney stone, it's close, it's in the same system. It's a bladder stone, stone in the human urinary bladder. Now for some reason, which remains unclear, and people have post postulated different theories, bladder stones are extremely uncommon today. In, you know, I practice emergency medicine, it's not even on my differential diagnosis if a patient comes in with abdominal pain. But in previous centuries, before the beginning of the 1900s, and it's probably attributed to the, to the processing of our foods and the changes of our dietary patterns, uh, stones in the, in, the, in the bladder were extraordinarily common and perhaps one of the most common conditions. And furthermore, even though they didn't understand a lot about anatomy and a lot about physiology in previous centuries, operating on the stone of the human bladder is one of the very first operations that was done in the history of mankind. And we have records of surgeries dating back to the first century of the Common Era, where Celsus writes a detailed discussion about, about operating for the, for the stone. How do they know about the existence of that stone if they didn't know about much else? They knew about it for a couple reasons. First of all, sometimes it actually was, came out of the body in the course of urination, and also you could actually feel it. It was so large that it could be palpated, it could be felt, either on, on an anterior abdominal exam, or if you did a rectal examination, you could, you could feel the bladder from the rectal examination. So he discusses a surgical procedure where they made an incision um, to, to actually remove the, uh, the stone in the bladder. Now, it, to this very day, in, in London, for example, and they were operating on, it was called cutting for the stone. That was the term that was used, because there was no other stone. And that, that had been done for, for centuries, if not millennia, from the times of antiquity until the times of, uh, of the Renaissance and, and, and beyond. Um, 
And to give you an idea of how prevalent cutting for the stone was, if you look on the bottom of your handout, you'll see a picture of a, uh, a man whom you might know from other sources, whose name was Brother Jacques, from the uh, famous song Frere Jacques. Brother Jacques, who, uh, who had a religious epiphany at one stage of his life and, became, uh, and, and entered the, uh, became a man of the cloth, before that happened, was a, uh, a wandering lithotomist. He was a wandering cutter of the stone. Now, why was he wandering? He was wandering because the mortality of his operation was about 50%. So you see, he couldn't stay too long in any particular location. And commenting on this exact idea of the risk of the procedure is none other than Rav Yaakov Emden in another, another uh, uh, work of his, <coughs> which is actually a commentary on the Shulchan Aruch, where he writes in the bottom right-hand corner about assessment of surgical risk. We're talking the period of the, uh, of the 1700s here. We're not talking a modern assessment. We're talking assessment in the 1700s. He says, said, some people will submit themselves to a surgery in order to remove the stone, to cut for the stone. And he says, and I'll just, I'll just synopsize what he says, he says that the reason they're motivated to do this is because the pain and anguish of the stone is a fate worse than death. Now, people say that kidney stones is the male analog of childbirth. Now, a kidney stone is measured in millimeters. A bladder stone is measured in inches. And if you go today to London in the Royal College of Surgeons, they have actual bladder stones that were removed from patients in the 1700s and 1800s, and they're like softballs. They're rocks. They're literally rocks. They're stones. So imagine your life with this stone that always stays in your bladder, constantly preventing you from, uh, from urinating properly, also a constant source of repeated infections. It was absolute misery. And to give you another idea of how miserable it was, um, in the only case in French history where an emperor did not follow his troops but led his troops into battle is Napoleon III in the Austria-Prussian War. Now, why did he do that? According to some historians, the reason he did that is because he was suffering from bladder stones and he, would prefer, he preferred to have died. He said, let me lead the troops into battle because maybe they'll kill me because I just can't take this pain anymore. This was all pre-anesthesia. Anesthesia is a product of the 1800s. It's with, without anesthesia and without antibiotics, without antisepsis. So the mortality, now keep in mind, so the motivation to do it was tremendous because they were suffering. But if they did it, they not only had a high rate of mortality, a very high percentage would die, but a very high percentage would be left with, uh, with an open wound and constant problems. Yes. So it's probably dietary. We don't know for sure, but probably there's some genetic causes of stones. There's some dietary causes of stones. Um, now, why they had then and we don't have now, that nobody really knows. But they, they postulate because it has to do with, uh, with dietary changes. So, so, so the Rabbi Yaakov Emden says it's, it's prohibited for somebody to undergo this kind of procedure because the risk is too high. Even though you're suffering tremendously, you're, uh, you're, you're, the odds are pretty high that you're going to die unless you're in, even in the best of hands, there was a fairly high percentage that you would die. And this is one of the texts, by the way, that's used also today by contemporary authorities um, about assessment of surgical risk and whether it's okay, according to Jewish law, for someone to undergo a, an experimental or untried procedure that has a potentially high mortality and you have to balance the, the potential benefit of the surgery and the, and, the, uh, and the risks of the surgery. Yes? In this context, could you mention anything about elective surgery? as we know it today from the halachic perspective, plastic surgery or other... Sure, sure, sure. Sure. So the, the, the question was, uh, uh, so how does halacha view elective surgery today? Uh, so that there are many discussions about the nature of the elective surgery, for example, plastic surgery, and the issue here has to weigh the risk versus the benefit. Now, very fortunately, and there's some other aspects they'll mention as well, um, we live in an age where the risk has been contained significantly. So people often invoke the risk of general anesthesia, for example, as a, as a factor not to undergo elective surgery in Jewish 
law. Um, general anesthesia is a relatively minor risk. Now, granted, the potential, there are one in 20,000, 30,000 uh, fatalities with, uh, with general surgery, if, if that high. Uh, so that's not considered at high enough of a risk. But it is something which has to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis, you know, what the, what, exactly what the procedure is, the nature of the procedure. With plastic surgery in general, uh, in, in specific, rather, there were discussions about manipulating the body that God had given you and the, the propriety of doing something like that, not only from a risk assessment perspective, but a philosophical perspective um, about making those kind of adjustments, uh, adjustments to the body. And another factor which factors into the consideration, specifically in, uh, in plastic surgery, uh, is, the, uh, is the psychological dimension of plastic surgery. So for example, if Moshe Feinstein um, allowed plastic surgery in a case uh, of a young girl who had uh, uh, who wanted a rhinoplasty, you know, who wanted a nose job, who he may not necessarily have allowed based on Jewish law, but her sense of self-image was so devastating and her, her notion of self was such that she couldn't function that uh, for her it was allowed because these factors were, were mitigating factors which allowed the, uh, the procedure. Yes? Just curious, then, is there a dichotomy in the treatment of Jewish and Christian patients based on the There are, uh, the answer to that is not a simple answer. There are definitely distinctions within the law about Jewish patients and non-Jewish patients. And part of it has to do with when we violate our own laws. So for example, uh, even anatomical dissection so, and we'll talk about, actually we'll talk about it more, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll put you on hold for a minute because we're going to talk about it more when we talk about organ donation, about uh, donating organs from one person to another person, and there, there, there are distinctions within at least the specifics of the law about being able to donate to Jewish versus non-Jewish because it involves violation of laws. Um, any other questions? Yes? So the question is, if there's a surgery that, that uh, Judaism wouldn't allow, would, it, would a Jewish physician be able to do it on a non-Jew? And the answer to that depends. And there are indeed, there are not only laws about Jews, there's also Jewish law about non-Jews. There's a whole code of law within the Jewish tradition about not only how Jews should act for Jews, but how non-Jews should act to each other. And that's the laws of Ben Noach. And there's extensive discussions about that. And, for, and not only are there laws about how each should relate to their own societies, but there are laws about he, how each should relate to each other. So there may be procedures which may be forbidden for me, but would be permitted for them. And it would be OK for me to perform that procedure for them. And, and it may be vice versa. Not only who the procedure is performed on, but the nature of the procedure. And there's one very unique exception to, uh, not an exception, but a unique, uh, unique uh, aspect of the interrelationship between Jewish law and non-Jewish law as it relates to abortion. Now, very interestingly, abortion is perhaps the only case where, it, according to Jewish law, a non-Jew who performs an abortion on a non-Jew is guilty of homicide and can be sentenced to death within the Jewish understanding of non-Jewish law. While a Jew who performed an abortion on a Jew, even though it may be prohibited, could not be sentenced to death. Now, why that is is a very detailed legal analysis. But that's, that's a very interesting distinction between Jewish law and non-Jewish law. So for a Jew to do an abortion on a non-Jew may actually be worse than doing an abortion on a Jew. And a non-Jew performing an abortion on a Jew may be worse than a Jew performing an abortion on a Jew. It, it relates to both. It has to do with both. It, there's some things that there's some things that Jews would not be able to perform, uh, there, and it depends on the procedure, on the patient, and on the anesthesiologist. Also has a hand in uh, you know can an anesthesiologist assist in a procedure which would be a violation of Jewish law because he's not actually performing the procedure, but he's facilitating the performance of the procedure. So all those things would factor into the consideration. Yes. Of 
excellent question. It requires a little bit of background to answer that question. The, uh, the question was, if, if there is a surgery which is required to be performed on the cervical spine, and the loose bone is, a, uh, is involved in the procedure, and I'll tell you what the loose bone is in a moment, then uh, are you allowed to do the procedure? So the assumption, well, first let me tell you what the loose bone is in Jewish tradition. Uh, the loose bone in Jewish tradition is a bone in the human body which is an indestructible bone and a bone which is believed to be the bone from which the resurrection will take place of any particular individual. And that's why it needs to be indestructible. There has to be some remnant of the original person in order to, uh, to have the, uh, the human body uh, reconstructed from that, uh, from that original uh, bone which, which, does not, uh, which cannot be destroyed. Um, the, uh, there are many discussions about the identity of the loose bone, and your, your statement presupposes that there is a consensus about what the loose bone is. There's absolutely not. The loose bone is either at the, at the, uh, by the coccyx or by the, uh, the, the sixth or seventh vertebra, or the, the one which can be palpated in the, in the back. So, so nobody, nobody has identified the loose bone with absolute certainty. Um, and no one says that it's the seventh vertebra or the sacrum or, or even other, other possible bones or candidates. Uh, even Vesalius, by the way, the great uh, Vesalius, has a chapter on the loose bone in, in, the, in his work uh, uh, which, uh, which discusses uh, the Jewish tradition about the loose bone. He said there's no such thing, it's impossible, there's no bone that cannot be destroyed. Um, and actually on a, on a somewhat sad and tragic uh, aspect of the loose bone, there are people who discuss the loose bone in the, in the context of the Holocaust, God forbid, uh, in the crematoria, and say that there are certain bones that, that, that withstood the heat of the crematoria. And some people postulate that these bones might have been the, might have been the loose bone. Um, so there's a lot, lots of discussions. But in answer to your question, no, uh, it would not prevent you from performing cervical uh, spinal surgery or any spinal surgery based on this notion of the loose bone. And I'll tell you, remind me, when we talk about organ donation, it fits into the organ donation too, about what Rabbi Arya, Arya Kaplan's contemporary understanding of the loose bone in, in the reconstruction of the body. Yes. Yes, that's, a, that's where we are returning to. <laughs> That's exactly where we are returning to. So if you look in the bottom left-hand corner also, we talked about uh, th this procedure, cutting for the stone. At this exact historical period that Rabbi Chesca Landau was writing, he, um, he, uh, he writes, there was experimental procedures being done in London on the cutting for the stone, on what was called lithotomy. And, the, uh, and you have here in the Philosophical Transactions of 1746, an account of a new type of, of surgery, a remarkable case of a person cut for the stone in the new way by a very famous surgeon, William Cheseldon. So I postulate, again, this is pure theory, that the kinds of case that was presented to Rebecca Landau might have been one of these new experimental procedures that they were performing to learn how to better cut for the stone. And they asked him, can you do this because we're doing a new surgery and we don't know if it's appropriate or not and we'll have to reassess afterwards. So. Uh, as we'll have to reassess afterwards. So the, um, the answer that Rabbi Chesca Landau gave, and with this we'll close session one, and actually we'll pick up a little bit of the end of session one before we continue into session two. The, um, the answer that he gave is, you are clearly for the sake of pikuach nefesh, and this is a term that was mentioned and I will clarify and define for us now, for the sake of saving human life, you are clearly absolutely allowed to violate Jewish law. There are only three laws you are not allowed to violate, and this will clearly, this will relate to our section on, uh, on organ transplantation. You're not allowed to violate uh, homicide, you're not allowed to kill somebody to save another life, you're not allowed to violate um, sexual promiscuity, arias is the Hebrew term, and the third one, which ha doesn't have so much of a contemporary context, but idol worship, avodah zarah, uh, which is more times of antiquity than today. Those are the three cardinal sins, as they're called, that you're not allowed to violate. Everything else you're allowed to violate for the sake of human life. So, one would think that perhaps the answer to the question would be yes, but he said no. There are criteria that are applied in order to, to meet that threshold to violate for pikuach nefesh. And in order to meet that threshold, the, coin, the term which was coined from the Nod Behuda was, there has to be a chole lifanenu. There has to be somebody who is sick who will directly and immediately benefit from this procedure.
This case did not meet that threshold. To do an autopsy, because maybe somebody will come in a, a, tomorrow, a week from now, a year from now, might have the same condition, and even if he has the same condition, maybe benefit from the information, maybe not benefit from the information, does not meet the threshold. So if there would have been an individual in the next room who could have directly benefited from the results of the autopsy, the answer would have been yes. But if not, as was this case, the answer was no. And as we'll see in our next section, this will relate to the issue of organ donation and transplantation as well. And uh, we will now have a break. Um, welcome to uh, the end of part one and the beginning of part two. The, uh, just just a, few, uh, a few comments. First of all, um, I apologize when I, in my handouts, well, I changed them to the past, the present, and the future. I neglected to change part one to part two and part three. So they all read part one. So I apologize about that, uh, about that mistake. Um, also, um, there, w there was a question or two about uh, future source material. If one uh, is interested in, uh, in exploring the, uh, the field of Jewish medical ethics further, what, uh, what authors uh, would I recommend for such, uh, for such an endeavor? And I will give you the names of, uh, of two or three authors for those of you who are interested. Um, and each of them have, uh, have multiple works. So the, uh, the name of the author, if you, uh, if you uh, request from Amazon, uh, or just put in the name of these authors in Amazon, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll receive a number of, uh, of books that they've written. One is Dr. Fred Rosner, R-O-S-N-E-R. Uh, who has written extensively on Jewish uh, medical ethics over the years and has wonderful uh, introductory texts to the field of Jewish medical ethics. Um, there is uh, Rabbi David Bleich, B-L-E-I-C-H, who has written also extensively on all aspects of Jewish law and in, in particular uh, Jewish uh, medical ethics um, and uh, tends to be a little more technical uh, and, and uh, and then there is a new uh, contribution, of the, uh, which just recently translated into English, um, and that is uh, a work, an extraordinary work by Avraham Steinberg, S-T-E-I-N-B-E-R-G, Abraham Steinberg, uh, the Encyclopedia of Jewish Medical Ethics, um, which was uh, written in Hebrew in six volumes and translated into English by Fred Rosner into three volumes, uh, recently, uh, recently published about a year or so ago. Uh, which is a tremendous reference work, not only in uh, in its uh, scope but also in its uh, its um, footnotes. Footnotes are just uh, just a tremendous uh, thing. I should also add that uh, a colleague of mine, whose mother is here today, Dina Zimmerman, um, who is a is making wonderful contributions to uh, to women's health care in Jewish law, just published a book on the uh, on the interface of uh, of women's issues and Jewish law. Uh, and that's uh, Dina Zimmerman, and I had the opportunity to spend some time with her in Copenhagen at a conference that we both uh, we both attended. Um, also, my apologies for there are some of the sources that are only in Hebrew and not translated into English. I apologize for that, uh, as they they have not been officially translated. So I uh, I don't have as much time as I would like to be able to translate them all for you in the handouts, and uh, and I do apologize for that. Yes. Yes, yes. An another another addition to the uh, to the literature is uh, Rabbi David Feldman, who wrote a book on uh, on contraception and abortion in Jewish law uh, um, a number of years ago, which has been updated. And he also has a number of other contributions to to, uh, to Jewish medical ethics. Those are the main authors in the English language. Uh, there are um, I collected actually the books written just books, not articles written on Jewish medical ethics. And if you're interested, I can give you my email. I'd be happy to email you that that uh, it's about 150 entries. 150, 200 entries, yes. Rabbi Dorf, that's an excellent point. I, I'm mentioning from the Orthodox tradition. Rabbi Dorf is, is uh, made uh, bountiful uh, contributions to the field of Jewish medical ethics from the conservative perspective. Absolutely, and there are others in the Reform tradition. My uh, my experience and my teaching is in the is in the Orthodox tradition. 
Rabbi Jacobowitz, um, Emmanuel Jacobowitz, um, was was the uh, former chief rabbi. He passed away a number of years ago. Uh, the chief rabbi of England, uh, who was knighted by the Queen as well. It's Sir. I don't remember which comes first. Rabbi Sir uh, the uh, Lord uh, Emmanuel Jacobowitz. Uh, he actually wrote a book called Jewish Medical Ethics, which was an outgrowth of his PhD dissertation for University College in London. It was probably the first English book on the field of Jewish medical ethics. Uh, it still has a tremendous amount of valuable material. Obviously, the science has evolved from the 60s until today, uh, but it still has a, a wonderful uh, amount of, of information. Uh, Rabbi Tendler, and thank, thank you all for your, uh, your uh, <laughs> contributions to the literature. Um, Rabbi Tendler is, is probably one of the most vocal figures in, uh, in Jewish medical ethics, but it is not as prolific in print as the others. Uh, so he has very little that's been published. One of the things he does have published, um, I, hap I happen to have here today, and that, uh, and again, I thank you for uh, for uh, for suggesting that. Um, it's the response of Rav Moshe Feinstein. Rav Moshe Feinstein of blessed memory was one of the great Torah sages who passed away a number of years ago of the late 20th century. Rabbi Tendler was uh, is Rav Moshe's son-in-law. Um, and was very close with him in, in discussing many of these issues of, of definition of, uh, of life and medical ethics. Uh, and this book is a is an excerpted responsa by Rabbi Moshe Feinstein and a translation of those, and in addition, some original essays by Rabbi Tendler about uh, the care for the critically ill. Um, this was volume one. There were supposed to be more volumes about other issues of medicine. Unfortunately, those uh, those did not follow. Hopefully, God willing, in the in the future, those those editions will follow. Uh, I just wanted to complete, and we'll do it in brief fashion, from, from section one, from the past. I'll give myself a time limit on this. We'll say about, uh, about 15 minutes or so on, on, uh, to complete section one. The, um, we talked about the history of anatomical dissection. If you go to the section called grave robbing, What happened as a result of anatomical dissection is much like the mumia situation, there was a tremendous amount of uh, demand, but simply not enough supply. So now, all of a sudden, in the uh, 18th century, every medical school now required anatom anatomical dissection for their students, but there simply weren't enough bodies to go around. So uh, this led to a lot of, uh, of not so wonderful practices, and one of the practices was, was grave robbing. Uh, and it was common, there was a black market for people to go into cemeteries at night and uh, exhume bodies from the cemeteries and to sell these bodies to the, uh, to the uh, medical schools. Uh, now, someone mentioned before about Jewish bodies, non-Jewish bodies. They're, um, they actually, interestingly, preferred the Jewish cemeteries because of the practice in Jewish law to bury early. So it, because Jews buried so early, the bodies were fresher bodies and better for anatomical dissection. So this obviously led to a serious problem for the Jews who had Jewish cemeteries that needed to be preserved and needed to be guarded. Also, um, we had mentioned Vesalius was a, uh, was a lecturer at the, at, in Italy. The, the university that he lectured at was the University of Padua in northern Italy. And the University of Padua has a very rich history for the Jews. And the reason that is, is because in, in universities from medieval through Renaissance times, in order to obtain a degree at the university and to complete your training and be licensed as a physician in addition to other specialties, you have to avow your belief in Christianity, which pretty much precluded any Jew from, uh, from obtaining a license. One of the very few exceptions to that was the University of Padua in northern Italy, despite its proximity to the, uh, to the Pope, to Rome. It was a separate district, had separate laws, was not bound by the, the laws of the Pope, and did not require its graduates to avow their belief in Christianity. And once they established this practice, sometime in the 1400s, 1500s, Jews from all over Europe flocked to this university. Uh, and what was unique about this university is that uh, it allowed Jews to attend, even though there were discriminatory practices against the Jews. They had higher tuition fees. They, the first snow of the season, the Jews had to supply meat to the entire faculty. There were a lot of unbelievable discriminatory practices. Um, but, uh, but despite that, the Jews did attend the university, but they also paid a very high sum to prevent Jewish bodies from the cemeteries from being dissected. Uh, and that was also part of, the, uh, part of their practice at that time. And there's actually a story, it wasn't in Padua, but in northern Italy, where a, uh, there was, it was Sukkot, it was the holiday of Sukkot, and there was only one esrog for the entire community 
in, the, in, this, in this northern Italian area, and they were transferring the esrog from the Ashkenazi community to the Sephardic community, uh, and a band of students descended upon them and kidnapped the esrog and held it hostage until they would allow bodies from the Jewish cemetery to be dissected. Uh, so they had to pay a very handsome uh, fee in order to prevent that, uh, in order to prevent that from happening. But to give you, and I'll answer your question in a second. But to give you an idea of how how um, the quality of the University of Padua, where these Jews were attending, this was no second-rate university. Not only was Vesalius one of the lecturers at uh, at the University of Padua, uh, but Galileo was a lecturer at the University of Padua, and Jews were attending their lectures, uh, and. In conjunction with that, there was a very famous yeshiva in the University of Padua, which was run by a figure called the Maharam of Padua. Uh, and many of the students would attend yeshiva at the nighttime and attend University of Padua in the morning. Um, and it, was, it must have been quite a rich educational experience in the Renaissance. Yes? Uh, it's kind of an unfair question, but amongst the Hasidim, uh, notable Hasidim, there, there is a belief that certain rebbes, certain very saintly individuals, that they embody that that is true there is a belief that the bodies of tzaddikim uh, righteous people do not decompose uh, that has not been put to a double blinded uh, study um, but there are historical accounts over the centuries of people you know, because first of all we don't exhume the body generally so there's no way to really know uh, but there are cases where exhumation was required for a variety of reasons, and uh, and there are very you know a handful of historical accounts attesting to the fact that some of these great sages did indeed uh, not decompose their bodies did not decompose. But again, I can't I can't attest to the uh, to that in a, in a comprehensive in a comprehensive way. So what you have here in your handout are are some of the the things that were done to prevent the the graves from being robbed. And in the upper right hand, to give you an idea of the prevalence of grave robbing, none other than William Shakespeare wrote on his epitaph. Good friend, for God's sake, forbear to dig the dust enclosed here. Blessed be ye man that spares these stones, and cursed be he that moves my bones. So even William Shakespeare was afraid of grave robbing at that time. You know, he, he was in the 1600s, because um, that's when the practice began. So what you have for her for here is, uh, and I won't read it inside, you're welcome to read it, um, an excerpt from Cecil Roth, who's the, uh, the editor of Encyclopedia Judaica, uh, wrote a number of wonderful histories of, uh, of England and Italy. Here in the history of the Great Synagogue, he talks about a particular practice of, uh, of having people... Um, guard the cemeteries on a rotational basis as part of their obligations of the community. So once a person became a certain age, until the age of 70 or so, they had to do a rotation to overnight to watch the cemeteries to make sure none of the, none of the graves were being, uh, were being violated. And, uh, and, uh, and I just have to share with this with you because I thought it was so uh, interesting. I was, it was one late night in the ER when uh, things were a little slow and I was searching on the internet and I did a Google search on Jews and grave robbing. So you can imagine I got a plenty of anti-Semitic uh, things that related to Jews and grave robbing. But one, one thing I did get was a, a response, or a hit as it's called, from, from a, a library in the south of England who had a particular manuscript relating to grave robbing and the Jews. So I immediately sent away for the manuscript, and I, and I got it, uh, and what you have here is a copy of that. And what it is, is it's the very ticket which was handed to the individuals in the Great Synagogue of London to indicate that this individual had the obligation to watch the cemetery on that night. So they were handed and told them from what time to what time, and there was a financial obligation. If you read it, it's a little hard to read. This individual's name was Shlomo Schneider. The name was written in, but the rest of it was printed. It says, Samuel Begoral, the lottery has fallen on you. Lelech Lishmor Bebeisachayim, to go watch in the uh, Beisachayim is the euphemism. It's the house of life, but it's really the cemetery. De uh, Kihilasenu of our congregation, and it says the exact date. Um, it's the late 1700s, 1780s, roughly. Min Glock 8, from the time of 8 o'clock at night, ad la until the morning, until 7 o'clock in the morning. And if, and if you fail to do so, it says, you will be fined a certain amount if you want to get someone as a replacement. But if you fail to do so, you don't show up, and you don't get a replacement, there'll be a very high fine, and there's no way you'll be able to be absolved from this fine until you pay it. So that was a, fa that a fascinating thing. I suspect that this probably was something similar that, uh, that Cecil Roth used in his research uh, in these discussions. And there were other modified forms of burial uh, which were uh, discussed with the rabbinic authorities in order to prevent grave robbing. Um, and in the bottom of your handout, you have one, one uh, picture from a uh, graveyard in London. Um, and I'll just read you the advertisement. It says, uh, many hundred bodies 
will be dragged from their wooden coffins this winter for the anatomical lectures, for those who deal in the dead, for the supply of the county practitioner in the Scotch schools. The question of the right to inter an iron is now decided. The violation of the sanctity of the grave is said to be needful for the instruction of the medical pupil. But let each one about to inter a mother, husband, child, or friend say, shall I devote this object of affection to such a purpose? If not, the only safe coffin is Bridgman's patent wrought iron one. Charge the same price as a wooden one. So it was, you know, entrepreneurs. And this is the coffin. It's a wrought iron coffin into the ground. There's no way anybody can grave rob for, uh, for something like that. Yes, that was... Uh, Right, what you're, what you're referring to is a practice which ultimately led to the change of laws in London and the change of laws in the United States at all. The, the practice was done by, uh, there's a very famous trial in England for Lottie, which uh, it was on the front page of the, uh, the London Times for a long time, and it was the, the trial of Burke and Hare. Uh, and this was a hotel in, in London, uh, outside, not in London actually, in, the, in I think the south of England, where derelicts used to, uh, used to, used to come to this hotel and uh, and one of the derelicts owed the owner of the hotel a lot of money and had the nerve to actually die before they paid them back the money. So the owner of the hotel said, you know, what am I going to do now? I can't really do much. Uh, how am I going to get the money? So they heard about the black market of selling bodies to the medical school. So they sold the body to the medical school and they got a fair amount of money. And then they thought to themselves, well, it's so easy to get money. We have a lot of derelicts in the hotel. Nobody's going to miss them anyway. Why don't we just kill them and send them to the medical school. And that's what they did for, for a number of months. And they killed a number of people until they actually killed somebody that, whom others noticed was gone. And then ultimately this was exposed and there's the trial of Burke and Hare. And even if you look in the dictionary, there's a remnant of this. To, to Burke somebody is a verb, is to suffocate them. Because that's the method they use to kill their, uh, to kill their victims. This was the 1800s. It was the 1800s. And actually, if you look in Edgar Allan, well, that's a different, the buried alive is a different issue, that, which we'll, we'll talk about in, in, in just, <laughs> just a few moments. Wonderful things we're talking about. Good thing we had our, our, our food already. Um, and just a comment uh, or two about these other two chapters before we shift into the modern era. Uh, one is the, uh, the history of smallpox. Um, and, and I just think it's such an essential chapter to set the stage for, for our, modern, uh, our modern understanding. You know, I, I always ask, you know, has anybody in this room ever seen a case of smallpox before? And the, invariably the answer is no, uh, with occasional one hand up maybe. Um, smallpox was a disease which was endemic in Europe and killed, according to statisticians, perhaps more people in the history of mankind than all other causes of death combined. And uh, obviously you can't prove that in a double-blinded study, but, uh, but they don't say that about other diseases. Uh, which gives you an indication of the of the devastation that it wrought, uh, and it affected the Jewish community. and uh, in, And you have a treatise in the upper left hand corner, written by uh, by a, a rabbi in the 1700s in London, who lost a number of children to the, to smallpox. And th this is another classic case of a new discovery which presented serious halachic problems. And the new discovery for treatment of smallpox was inoculation. Now, inoculation involved taking fluid from somebody who had smallpox and transferring it to somebody under the skin of somebody who didn't have smallpox in the hopes of exposing them to a minor form of the disease and prevent them from developing the serious or fatal form of the disease. And this is what was done. So why did this present a problem? It presented a problem because there was the chance of exposing somebody to a risk who wasn't sick. So you have, for example, there's a, a tombstone on Long Island, and you have a copy of the tombstone here of, uh, in the right-hand uh, side in memory of Peleg, the son of Thomas and Mary Conklin, who died of smallpox by inoculation, age 17 years old. So you had a 17-year-old healthy person who, was, who died because of smallpox. So what was the halachic problem? The halachic problem, and this relates to the whole practice of medicine in general, the law is and we have a license to practice medicine. The Torah teaches us, virapo yirape and you shall surely heal. It's a double language for rapo yirape. So many over the centuries rabbis have learned out that we don't say that God can, uh, can cause disease and who are we to, to involve ourselves in the treatment of man. No, we say God has given us the right uh, and given us the knowledge to become physicians and the knowledge to treat disease and reverse disease and we should embrace that knowledge and use that knowledge to treat people who suffer from disease. However, this was not such a case. In this particular case, you are not treating somebody who had a disease, you are taking an individual who was healthy and exposing them to disease. 
Uh, who said the Jewish law gives you that right? So there was an extensive discussion, and, and, uh, and, and we'll curtail it for our purposes. But in essence, the uh, Rabbi uh, Lifshitz said, who was in his commentary of the Mishnah, um, and I'll just read the second line in that uh, top hand, top uh, handout. Umize nearly heter la asos inoculation shall pakin. And therefore, it appears to me that based on my legal analysis, one can perform smallpox inoculation based on my statistical analysis, the same thing Reverend David Ben Zimra did. He, uh, he went to the physicians and found out what are the odds that if somebody has a smallpox inoculation, they're going to die. So they told him it's roughly one in a thousand. And he says, in, specifically, even though one in a thousand people are going to die by taking this smallpox inoculation, if you don't get the inoculation and you come down with a spontaneous form of smallpox, which was endemic in Europe, the odds are much higher that you're going to die as a result. So he was integrating the contemporary or current scientific information and making what was an absolutely essential rabbinic decision to allow inoculation to prevent millions of people from suffering from a disease. It's a tremendous, uh, tremendous breakthrough. And here again, applying the force of Jewish law to, uh, to contemporary circumstances. The ovarian transplant perhaps will leave for, uh, for our discussions at the, at the end when we talk about uh, um, genetics. We now shift gears to the present. Well, scrofula is actually tuberculosis. Smallpox, the cowpox we're referring to was the second stage after inoculation. The first stage of treatment was inoculation. And then a man named John Hunter, uh, not John Hunter, I'm sorry, um, Jenner. Yeah, J uh, Jenner, right, uh, Jenner. Um, he, he actually was not the originator of this idea, but uh, was the first one to test it in a, in a thoughtful fashion. He, he realized that there are many people who suffered from cowpox, who, who, many of these milk maidens, who, uh, who would milk the cows and come down with disease cowpox, which is a very benign and not a life-threatening uh, disease, they never got smallpox. This protected them, that was the observation, from developing the disease smallpox. So what he did in an experiment which probably would not have been approved by the FDA, he took a number of people, exposed them to cowpox, and then exposed them to very high concentration of smallpox, and found out that indeed they did not get the disease smallpox. And that was the first vaccination in the history of mankind. I'll get you a question in one second. And, the, uh, and actually the etymology of the term vaccination takes its origins from this process because vaca in Latin means cow. So the very word vaccination traces its origins back to this uh, to this cowpox uh, uh, experiment with uh, with Edward Jenner. Yes. You were speaking about genetics, and I just sort of slipped in this question very rapidly. In reading Rashi uh, in the uh, Linea Chumash, he speaks of the fact that if a woman has an orgasm before a man, you'll have a male birth, and if it's the man, man who has the orgasm, then you have a female. There was some exiguous work. Mm -hmm. Do you have any that can us? Yeah, the the, um, the question is if I should address it now or address it later. I'll, I'll address it briefly now and remind me if I don't get to it later. The the Talmudic passage, which talks which which talks exactly as you mentioned, it says, "Ishim is aras tchila." If a woman is mizaras tchila, now the one translation of that is if a woman has orgasm first, a child will be a male child. Uh, and that relates, by the way, to the very same phrase that we talked about, the seven-chambered uterus. It's based on that same phrase in the Torah when it says, Isha ki tazria zachar. When a woman is mazria, then the child will be a male child. And there have been a lot of discussions about what exactly that Talmudic passage means. Does it mean, does it refer to orgasm? Does it refer to ovulation? Um, there's a lot of discussions about that. And in terms of gender determination, um, I actually gave a, uh, my daughter, I have a daughter who's seven months old, and her name is Ilana. And I gave a talk in honor of her birth about gender determination in Jewish law. And the topic was, will it be Ilan or Ilana? <laughs> but the research that you're referring to, which, which apparently justified this notion was, uh, was done by a man named Shettles, uh, S-H-E-T-T-L-E-S, who wrote a couple decades ago that, uh, you know, based on the timing, that if, uh, you know, if, if, the, uh, if, if uh, ejaculation takes place at a certain time in relationship to the woman, there's a, more, a greater likelihood that it'll be a male child versus a female child. And, and that research was marshaled as justifying this Talmudic passage about, uh, about the, uh, the determination of gender. I mean, there's more. I have more on that. If you're, well, you're welcome to email me, I can send you some more information on that. Yes? 
the male determines the sex of the child, that is correct, but the differentiation that he discussed also had to do with which, the male determines the child because the male sperm, they're both Y sperm and X sperm. The female egg is always X. The male sperm is either Y or X, so yes, it is the male sperm that determines, but the speed at which the male and female sperm swim is different. So that was part of the determination that, I don't remember, I think the female sperm swim uh, faster, so I don't, remember, I don't remember exactly, I don't want to misquote, but, but the, the speed at which the, uh, the sperm swim had to do with that Shettle's research in terms of, uh, of determining which, what's the likelihood that it'll be a male child. <laughs> Perhaps, I, I don't remember, I don't remember the specifics. So we return to the present. We have now uh, struggled our way through the past. And the topic of our discussion in the present is going to be a very, very important topic, and that's the field of organ transplantation. And just to give you an idea of where we stand in terms of this field, I printed some statistics for you on the front page of your handout, which I copied a few days ago from January 18th uh, at 8.04 in the morning. And the, uh, and the list tells us how many people currently in the United States alone are waiting organs for transplantation. And that list includes all 90,632 people are awaiting organs at this time. And the breakdown of the people that are awaiting organs by organ is also on your handout. Uh, those who are awaiting kidneys, roughly 65,000, which is a lion's share. Excuse me. And the, uh, and the remainder, um, small amounts, kidney, um, liver, intestine, heart, lung, heart, lung, et cetera. The, uh, it also tells you how many transplants were performed in 2005, uh, and that total was 23,000. And it tells you also a little further on, the donors, the amount, the number of people who donated in the year 2005, uh, and that list includes roughly 6,000 deceased donors and about 6,000 living donors. There's donors, and we'll, we'll talk about that's exactly the source of our discussion, the nature of these, of these types of, uh, of donations. Um, and I'd like to divide our, our talk about organ donation into two sections because there are really two types of organ donation. There is a living donation and cadaveric donation. Donation from a living human being to another living human being and donation after somebody is deceased. And even that, what exactly defines deceased or cadaver, that's a matter of debate, and that's the substance of, of, of discussion in Jewish law. Um, but one statistic w that I do not have here on the page is not how many donors there were, not how many people are on the list, but probably the most important statistic, how many people die each year on the list awaiting organs. And that's in the thousands. It's about three to 4,000 people each year die because there aren't enough organs. It's not because there aren't enough transplant surgeons. There's plenty of surgeons, there are plenty of centers, there aren't enough organs. Uh, and the transplant community is trying very hard to increase the amount of donation. And there are a number of uh, very creative suggestions that have been made to increase donation from the living population, uh, financial incentives uh, to pay people for donation, uh, to, to uh, people who agree to donate, maybe push them higher on the list to receive an organ if they themselves might need an organ. Um, presumed consent is another option. Uh, so f as, as it stands now in the United States, we all have on our, uh, our driver's licenses, um, although this is Manhattan, maybe not everybody has a driver's license, I don't know, but, uh, but uh, and the driver's license on the other side of the driver's license is a, uh, is a uh, organ donor uh, card. Um, and in the United States now, in order to become an organ donor, you have to opt in. So the assumption is you will not donate your organs. If you want to donate, you sign a card. What they're experimenting with in other countries is presumed consent, which is if, if you don't sign the card, the assumption is that you will be an organ donor. Only if you actively sign the card, then that you will not be an organ donor. Now, that wouldn't fly so well in the United States because of our notions of autonomy and rights and freedom, and no one would say, you know, no one would handle or tolerate in the United States that uh, they'll take our bodies unless we say otherwise. Yes? Every hospital in New York must notify the donor network as soon as someone dies. That is correct. The, 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 
Right. The comment was that the, the law is, and it's New York, and I, and I practice this almost on a daily basis in the emergency department, that once, once someone dies in New York, you have an ob a legal obligation to notify the organ donor network. But that doesn't impact on the consent. Right. Then, the, then you can discuss consent with the family. Yes? It's actually not It's all federal. Okay, great, great. Because I know it's practicing. I didn't realize that it was federal. And, and the, the, that makes sense. So at least the organ donor network is notified, and then they can work on obtaining consent um, in the United States. And even, by the way, if someone signs their donor card that they want to be a donor, if the family, uh, if the family vetoes that, the, the organ donor community is hesitant to, uh, to harvest those organs. They usually won't do it. So it's not even, it's, it's not presumed consent for sure wouldn't work. If they're not going to harvest, even if a person signs their own donor card and they can, it can be vetoed by the family, the odds of presumed consent uh, wouldn't, being successful is, is highly unlikely. So let's talk about living organ donation. And I'd like to share with you the following case, which is a real case. And, uh, and we'll use that as a springboard for our discussion about, uh, about what Jewish law has to say about living organ donation. And then we'll, in section two, we'll talk about cadaveric donation. Um, now, first of all, which organs can be donated from one living human being to another living human being? Kidney. Kidneys. Cornea. Liver. Cornea is actually usually from, uh, from deceased. Bone marrow. Bone marrow. Bone Very important. Marrow. Bone marrow is an organ. Blood. Blood is an organ. Skin actually uh, can be. Can, you can, uh, people often donate to themselves skin if they need for, for auto transplantation, but usually that would be in, in rare circumstances. But skin is mo more often cadaveric than, uh, than not. Um, heart, uh, maybe is some, maybe not, usually not from the living. Usually not from the living. Um, there could be, actually, there could be some tissue donation possibly, but obviously not in a whole organ, uh, on a whole organ. So the, I'll share with you the following case, which, will, uh, which has interesting ethical and halachic uh, ramifications. There was a young girl, uh, it's probably about five years ago now, uh, by the name of Renata Daniel Patterson, um, who uh, sadly suffered from uh, kidney disease. And, uh, and very fortunately, in the society that we live in, and for the last few decades, uh, there is a treatment for kidney disease, but that treatment is called dialysis, which is in essence an artificial kidney. Uh, now, it's obviously a wonderful treatment because people without the dialysis would all die, but it's still a very difficult life to be on dialysis, and there's plenty of complications associated with kidney disease for those who are on dialysis. So she was on dialysis um, for a period of time. Uh, as her particular family circumstance was, her uh, father was estranged from her mother, and he landed himself in prison. Um, he found out that his daughter was suffering from kidney disease, and he volunteered to donate a kidney. So as, uh, as luck would have it, he was actually a decent match, and he uh, served as a kidney donor for his daughter, Renata. Um, unfortunately, uh, a requirement for receiving a kidney is that someone has to take medication on a daily basis, usually for the rest of your life, to prevent your body from rejecting that kidney. Because normally, <clears throat> the body considers anything foreign to be an enemy and begins to attack it. And the only way to prevent that is another extraordinary development in transplantation medicine, is the development of medicines in the category called immunosuppressive medicines. What that means is it suppresses your immune system. Um, so if you don't suppress your immune system, your body will reject that organ. So she was a teenager. It's the first time in her, you know, in, in her recent memory that she'd been able to behave like a teenager. And you can well imagine the likelihood of a teenager taking daily medications is not so high, and she didn't. And she ended up rejecting her father's kidney. Um, her father made the following offer. He said, let me donate my second kidney to my daughter. I would rather go on dialysis than have her remain on dialysis. So the question that I ask you, our halachic question for today, for our bioethics committee, one, is it allowed for him to donate his first kidney? And two, is it allowed for him to donate his second kidney? Now keep in mind, it's not, it's not a definite death with the donation of his second kidney. He would just have to go on dialysis, which is fraught with all the complications we mentioned with, with dialysis. So let us now turn to the sources which deal with the issue of, of transplantation. Why would it be even that someone would consider giving a kidney to somebody? On what basis in the context of Jewish law would one think of giving a kidney to somebody? So the answer is the first passage from the Bible and your handout. Lo ta'amod al damreecha. Neither shalt thou stand aside when the blood of thy brother is being shed. Now what does that mean? That means 
one must intervene if somebody's life is at stake. It is an obligation, a biblical obligation, to save somebody's life. Now, obviously, secular society doesn't function like this. You know, they have laws uh, which protect people if in their, uh, in their uh, out of the goodness of their heart, they will stop at an accident, but there's clearly no obligation to do so. But in Jewish law, there is an obligation to do so. Now, what is the extent of that obligation? That's really our issue. How far does one have to go? What does one, what does one have to do in order to save somebody's life? Does the law give us any guidance? Does the law give us any parameters? So yes, it does. And if we look to a passage in the Talmud from the Tractate of Sanhedrin, it says, Whence do we know, I'll read in the English, that if a man sees his neighbor drowning or mauled by beasts or attacked by robbers, he is bound to save him? How do you know that you're obligated to do so? From the verse, thou shalt not stand by idly as the uh, blood of your neighbor is being shed. So the Talmud then asks a question, as it often does in its dialogue, and it clarifies positions and, and perhaps analyzes other verses that could also be used as a source for the similar idea. But it says, but it is, is it derived from this verse, the Talmud asks? Is it not rather from elsewhere? Perhaps there's another verse we could derive our obligation to save a life. Whence do we know that one must save his neighbor from the loss of himself? As the verse says, Vahashevosolo, thou shalt restore him to himself. So the Torah tells us, Vahashevosolo, you have an obligation to restore lost property to an individual. So the Talmud asks the following question. If you have an obligation to restore a pen to somebody, if they drop their pen or their glasses that they forget, of course you have an obligation to restore their health. There's no more prized possession to an individual than his or her health. So this is obviously subsumed under the obligation of, the, of, the, uh, of returning lost objects to people. So maybe that's our biblical source of the obligation to save somebody's life. We don't need the verse of lo ta'amod al damriyecha, the verse of uh, do not stand idly by as the blood of your brother is being shed. So the Talmud continues and, and, and says that we learn different things from the two verses. From that verse, I might think that it is only a personal obligation to save the life of a human being. So the, why would I think that? The laws of returning an object are very specific in Jewish law. So for example, if someone loses an object, I have an obligation to do my best to return it to them. So I can put up a sign if someone loses a, a dog or loses a glass or loses a pen, I can put up a sign in the local uh, store or in the area that they found it. Um, and to translate that into the, to a modern context, I, 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 I uh, read an email about a year or so ago of uh, someone who was in JFK airport and he left his tefillin in his, uh, his tefillin and his uh, talus, his prayer shawl in the airport and there was no name on it. So somebody found it and they posted an internet and I suspect like within a, a day, I, I think the entire world had, had the, an email that this person had lost their tefillin and, and lo and behold, the person identified himself and he was able to, to receive his tefillin. So perhaps that might be an obligation in our modern world to, put, to post an email on these websites where people read so if, so if an object is a lost object. But that's the extent of your obligation. You don't have to pay to return this object. You don't have to take an ad in the New York Times, on the front page of the New York Times, for five hundred dollars in order to uh, to save, uh, to, you know, to to return this lost object to somebody. And you for sure don't have to risk any, you risk your health or body or or, uh, or limb in order to uh, to return an object to somebody. You have to do the best you can. If you can't return it, you can't return it. That's uh, that's the parameters of the law. So therefore, if we just use that verse, it would be a relatively limited obligation to save a life. So we need the other verse of lo ta'amod al damreyecha, do not stand idly by, to tell us that there are additional obligations when you want to save life. It's not just an obligation if you can physically return it or, or do so with little effort or little money. And the Talmud says, um, so you would know that he would be bound to take the trouble of hiring men, even to, to expend financial resources. You need, you need that second phrase. So for example, you have somebody who's drowning on the beach and, um, and you don't swim so well. And the lifeguard is there. And you run to the lifeguard and you say, lifeguard, you know, there's a guy drowning. He says, listen, I'm on break. I got, I got 10 more minutes. So he said, I'll pay you $1,000 to, uh, to, to save this guy. He says, well, $1,000, you know, it's not so much money. Okay, I'll pay you $5,000. So how much money? How much money do you have to pay in order to, uh, to, to hire services? Or let's say you have someone who's on a mountain and the only way you can get there is to rent a helicopter and spend $50,000 in order to save that individual. How much money do you as an individual have to pay? So these are legal discussions and, uh, and the Talmud discusses them and the, there's extensive discussion in the rabbinic literature. Does one have to expend their entire wealth 
to save an individual or are there limitations? So it actually depends on the nature of the law and some laws you might have to genuinely spend your entire financial resources to, to either f to fulfill and some you might have a limitation of a fifth of your financial resources. That's not, not so much our discussion for today. But there are discussions about how much financial resource. Um, and <clears throat> And this twofold obligation is discussed by the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law, who says, when one sees his friend, this is the middle source on, the, on this page, <clears throat> when one sees his friend either drowning, being ambushed by robbers, or attacked by wild animals, now this is the codified version of this law, and can either personally save him, so there's a twofold obligation. There's the bodily obligation, you can physically save him. So, for example, you have, you know, a tiger escapes from the, uh, from the Bronx Zoo and you have a rifle in your, in your, uh, in your uh, trunk and you can easily, uh, you know, pull out your rifle and shoot that tiger. You clearly have an obligation to do so. So there's the bodily obligation and there's to hire another person to do so. There's a financial obligation. So if one neglects to do so, he violates the obligation of lo ta'amod al damriecha, of do not stand aside as the blood of your brother is being shed. And just so you have an idea of how Israeli society works, there is actually a law in Israel called the Lo Ta'amod al Damariyecha Law. Now, that would never fly in the United States. Um, in the United States, they have the, uh, and for some, it, it eludes me right now, the, um, the Good Samaritan Law, thank you. The, they have the laws of the Good Samaritan. Um, and again, those are really to protect somebody, but nobody will be fined if they walk by an accident and the person dies as a result. In Israel, there is a law on the books called the Lo Ta'amod al Damariyecha Law, which is a fine for someone who has an easy opportunity without tremendous risk to themselves to intervene and save somebody's life and they neglect to do so, they can be fined according to the law. Yes. Initial, Wonderful country, huh? The initial phrase, uh, Lo Tamar al Damreyecha, Damreyecha is your friend, your colleague. Why is it translated initially as brother, Lo uh, the truth is the English translation is not always an accurate translation, but your point is well taken. And this gets me to the question that was asked before, and I'll introduce it here, of the distinction between Jew and non-Jew. Now here, the, the biblical phrase is lo ta'amod al dam re'echa. Now the, the traditional interpretation of that, not the translation you'll read in, the, in your local translation, but the, the rabbinic tradition interpretation is re'echa b'mitzvos. Your, your friend or, or brother who is likewise obligated in the, in the, uh, in the, observation, in the, in the observance of mitzvos, like yourself, i.e. your fellow Jew. So it may not, in the literal uh, legal analysis, in the letter of the law, many of these discussions may not apply to saving a non-Jew. Again, in a textual analysis, in the, in the real world, in the, in the application, most people don't differentiate between saving Jew and non-Jew. And having said that, there are some who do differentiate. There are very limited circumstances where there may indeed be a differentiation. But by and large, the law doesn't, doesn't differentiate. But according to the letter of the law, there clearly is a differentiation. So we've covered a financial obligation, a bodily obligation, but there's one element of the obligation we haven't covered. How much risk do you have to incur to save somebody's life? Do I have to risk my own life to do it? All these cases were not life-risking cases. You know, if I can shoot somebody, shoot the animal, or, uh, you know, or call the cops when somebody is being, uh, you know, attacked, that's no harm to me. Uh, what if I have to incur a risk to myself? How much risk do I have to incur? And that is precisely the issue of living organ donation. Because I am risking my health in order to save the life of somebody else. Am I allowed to do that? Am I obligated to do that? Am I forbidden to do that? Because I have an obligation to preserve my own health as much as I have an obligation to save somebody else's. So whose health uh, supersedes? And that's precisely the, the, uh, the analysis of Rav David Ben Zimra. Rav David Ben Zimra, actually the same Rav David Ben Zimra who talked about the mumia. He also wrote about many other things. This is one of them. Um, and this is a tragic case, and it's not clear from the context whether it's a real case or a theoretical case. And he said, I was asked my opinion regarding the case of a ruler who asks a Jew, allow me to amputate one of your non-vital limbs, or else I will kill the Jew standing next to you. So the question is, as, as we said, is he obligated to do so because you have an obligation of lo ta'amod al dam re'echa? You can't stand by when the life of your, your friend is at risk. Or perhaps one is prohibited from doing so because even though it's a non-vital limb, there's still a lot of harm that's done to you by an amputation of a limb. Or is it maybe in the middle? You're not obligated to do so. You're not forbidden to do so. 
But if you want to do so, out of the kindness of your heart, the law will allow you to do so. So he says, some claim he is obligated to endure the amputation since the organ is not vital. So what is his answer? His answer is, this is an act of piety, which means, it's tremendous chesed, chesed is the Hebrew term, it's an act of piety to do so is clearly laudatory, clearly an act of extraordinary and exceptional kindness, but not something that would be required by Jewish law. And what he says, and uh, it, later on in, the, uh, in this is that, uh, and it's actually in the, uh, after the dots, and there's some uh, italics there also. Furthermore, it states, his ways are the ways of ple pleasantness. The God's ways in, in his Torah are the ways of pleasantness. And he says, how could one imagine a law that would obligate a person to allow himself to be blinded or to have his hand or leg amputated in order to save the life of a friend? Now, one could be allowed to do so, but to be forced to undergo an amputation or to, be, uh, to, to have the limb of yours removed, so you can't imagine a law that would allow that. Therefore, I consider, only this an act of pi I consider this only an act of piety, though not obligatory, with great benefit for the one who could withstand such an ordeal. However, if the rescue involves great risk, then the rescuer would be considered a pious fool. So here the Hebrew term is chasid shoteh. So there's a very famous phrase which has been um, ado adopted from, the, from this tshuva, which is used very widely. So yes, you want to save somebody's life, but if you're doing it and losing your own life, you're not a chasid, you're not a pious person, you're a chasid shoteh, you're a pious fool. And that should not be done. And generally we would interpret this to mean that one is forbidden to do so because the risk to that individual is too great a risk and one cannot incur such a great risk. Now if we turn the second page, we turn the next page and we'll see him qualify this. And he gives us three categories of risk which are directly applicable to organ donation. That which the Rambam wrote, and which is also similar to the Talmud by the way, one who is capable of performing a rescue, um, that includes a case where the rescue involves no danger whatsoever. So that's case A. So he gives examples, such as awakening a man sleeping under a shaky wall or providing key testimony which leads to exoneration. So there, that clearly falls under the rubric of do not stand by. You have an obligation to do that. There's no downside for you, no harm to you, no, uh, no risk. It also includes a stage up, a case where the rescue involves low or moderate danger, such as saving a man from drowning, on the assumption, of course, that you can swim and that it's, there's no tidal wave that's, that's happening, or from robbers or from wild animals. All these latter cases involve potential danger, yet one's inability to perform the rescue personally does not absolve one of the obligation, etc. Nevertheless, a reading in the underlying section, if the risk of danger nears certainty, even if the risk is equal, roughly 50-50, one is not obligated to take that risk for who says his blood is redder than yours. So he has here, in essence, distilling from Rabbi David Ben Zimmer's three categories. Category A, no risk and limited or minimal risk, where one is obligated to perform the rescue. Extreme risk, risk of death, where one is prohibited from doing the rescue. And then the big middle category, which falls into moderate risk, where one is clearly allowed, and it's a tremendous act of chesed to perform the rescue, but one is not obligated to perform the rescue. So how does that translate into practice? And I'll give you a few examples of how it translates, ending with an example of our initial case of organ donation. Case number one, and here I'll just actually just synopsize the, the literature rather than, than read it inside. Case number one, application of the law, is the context of plague and contagious diseases. So let's say you're in the Middle Ages, and there is a, uh, even until today, you have, uh, let's say you have a case of plague, and plague is contagious, serious to medical disease. How much risk do you have to take to either visit or treat somebody who has a contagious disease that you might acquire and might die as a result? So there are discussions, if you're a physician or if you're anybody who can help that patient, and there are discussions about if a physician is treated differently than a non-physician. It doesn't have to be a physician, even a health care worker, somebody who can provide some service to that individual. Is that person have a higher level threshold of risk than, say, a non-health care provider? Um, so, for example, there are cases of uh, the Beaker Cholim societies. And we, we didn't read it inside, but in the smallpox 
uh, handout, and we talked about smallpox, I had an excerpt from the Beaker Cholim Society of Berlin in the 1700s, which talks about cases where the Beaker Cholim Society is absolved from, att from uh, attending to the sick, even though they're on their deathbed. And that included cases of smallpox and cases of measles, because these were contagious diseases, and if you acquired that disease, you would potentially die as a result. So how much risk do you have to take? Now, in even a modern example, I don't know if you remember the, uh, in Toronto, the case of uh, SARS. There was discussions at that time. I remember I got a call from, uh, from a colleague of mine in Toronto. At the outbreak of SARS, he wanted me to come to Toronto to speak on the, uh, on the issue of, uh, of risk. And I said, I'm not so sure I want to go to Toronto and expose myself to the risk to, uh, to talk about the case of risk. But they, but they had the Beaker Cholim Society in Toronto met, and they determined that it was forbidden for them to go into the hospitals. We're not talking walking the streets. We're talking going into the hospitals where potentially people with SARS, an unknown, untreatable disease. You could imagine, I mean, I'm not here to frighten people, but uh, the media is frightening us enough, but with avian flu, with bird flu, there is, uh, there is tremendous fear about the potential for contagion in an untreatable disease, yes. Right, so the question is, what about the Hever Kedisha? What obligation do they have? What obligation do they have? Now, the obligation has evolved based on our ability to understand the nature of the communicability of disease and our ability to protect ourselves from disease. So in the old times, in the Middle Ages, Renaissance, in early modern period where they didn't understand contagion, transmission, you would, uh, you'd have to do a limited, uh, limited uh, um, uh, the Hever Kedisha would do a limited Tahara. And, uh, and you would uh, prevent yourself from exposing as much as possible, and even doctors, depending on the disease, would not necessarily be, be obligated to, uh, to attend to the sick. I mean, there may be some limitations. But now, there are very few diseases that in modern medicine we cannot protect ourselves from acquiring. Uh, so I remember, you know, I was a, an intern and resident when the AIDS epidemic was, uh, was just uh, coming on the scene and there was tremendous fear about what the disease is, how the disease is transmitted. Nobody knew how to treat the disease. And many practitioners were, were uh, refusing to treat patients with AIDS. There were surgeons that were refusing to operate on AIDS because of the, the blood exposure. Uh, now, things change because our understanding of disease changes. So now we know we can protect. We know that uh, there are universal precautions which would prevent you from So there's no excuse now because the risk to you is really not a high risk. It became a law. Really right, it became a law. That the doctor must. You can't say, no, I'm not. Right, the doctor must, but not an elective case. Right. Right, obviously in the emergency room the doctor must do so and that you have to have a society that but functions that way. Right, the 80s. right, and that became right, and it became a part of the American with Disabilities Act. Right, became part of the right correct. And the uh, just a historical note in your handout on the bottom left, what you have here is not a uh, illustration from the Bird's Head Haggadah. If anybody's ever seen the Bird's Head Haggadah. Um, but actually a picture of a physician's garb for treatment of plague in the Middle Ages. Now why is that? So you can see he's well covered. He's got a form of gloves. He's got uh, high boots. He's got a long coat. He's got a hat. But what do you think the beak is for? Any ideas? So they didn't understand contagion in, this, in, in that sense. but. The plague was so endemic and so many bodies, and excuse me for being graphic for a moment, there was so much rotting flesh that the smell was so profound, someone would faint by going into the room. So in the beak were pleasant smelling spices, it's honey and cinnamon, so they could breathe something that they could smell so that they could actually come near to the patients to be able to treat them. So that's one element of the, the interrelationship of uh, of uh, risk and uh, and saving lives. Another one we'll read, and, and there's some discussions here about uh, whether a physician has unique obligations or not, um, but I'm going to skip to number two, which is the case of the army medic in a fascinating uh, discussion. This is by Rabbi Zilberstein, who's a contemporary rabbinic authority in Israel, where he writes the, for the following question. And I'll read it in Hebrew, and you can read along in English. You have an army medic who is not in the line of fire, who is protected in a military circumstance. 
and he sees a soldier who is wounded in the line of fire. Haim chayav lahatzilo. Does he have an obligation to save him or not? Now he's in a protected circumstance. His life is not at risk in the barracks. But if he goes out into the line of fire, his life is clearly at risk and very high risk of death. Is he obligated to save his life or not? That's definitely an element, an element to it. So, for example, you know, if you have a, even if it's his job, uh, there are certain risks that even people whose job it is don't take. So, for take take 9/11, for example, the uh, nobody knew the risk of entering the building. The firemen did not know the risk. They didn't even think that no one had any imagination that the building would collapse. God forbid, the building collapsed. The second that building collapsed. What did the, you know, there were arguments about what the nature of the communication was, but they called the firemen in the other building and said, exit that building immediately. These are firemen. This is their job. But when the risk is too high, they don't, even firemen won't enter a building when the risk is too high. So there's certain limitations, and maybe the threshold might be higher for a fireman, but if the risk is very high, you wouldn't, uh, they, they wouldn't even recommend entering the building. Right, and the, and the recent case of the coal miners, the tragic case of the coal miners, because the risk was too high. Absolutely. So if you apply the basic parameters that we mentioned by, of, of David Ben Zimra, what do you think your answer is going to be? Yes. Um, I'm ready. Can I? That's, that's an excellent question. The morning after pill, which has become, uh, there have been a number of suits about that. Um, and and uh, actually, it's, it's, uh, uh, Uncle Sam said it's fine. And also, uh, the Catholic uh, community, the Catholic medical centers have taken over a lot of the medical care. Not only do they not provide um, postcoital contraception um, or abortions, they don't even suggest it as an option. So these are complicated. I mean, you raise a really excellent question. But the, the general relationship of an individual's religious beliefs and secular society, generally, we are very fortunate that we live in America, and America allows us to exercise our religious freedoms. So there are very rare cases that my religious freedom will not be protected. So for example, in an end-of-life situation in the ER, you know, I had a, a physician that had a, a patient uh, that uh, was, was put on a breathing machine, um, and the decision was made to remove the breathing machine to allow the patient to die, which is not un uncommon in the secular circ in this uh, society that we live in. So the physician said, you know, she was on the phone with the family. She said, uh, I have to go. Dr. Reichman is here. When you come, Dr. Reichman will, uh, will be with you, and he'll basically pull the plug. So I tapped her on the shoulder. I said, excuse me, Dr. Reichman will not pull the plug on this patient. She, it was so commonplace for her, she didn't even realize that I would have an, an objection to this. And, and society protects me. I'm not obligated to do that. I'm not obligated within the law or within the, the ethical community or within the hospital to do something which is against my religious beliefs. So you may not, as a pharmacist, you may have to provide other options. Um, but and these are, this is actually a very current issue in terms of how they will be forcing pharmacists to do it um, or not forcing pharmacists to do it, but, uh, but it's a complex issue. Yes. Yeah, but there is a precedent in medical school, et cetera, in OBGYN. If it's your belief that you don't believe in... Like, Performing you abortions, believe right. Abortion, as an OBGYN resident, you don't have to learn to be... Correct, correct. But in, initially, they did force people to, to observe or to, to participate in the abortions and would right. not accredit their training unless they participated. It, was only, it has changed by virtue of our, our, uh, the way our democratic society works. And to train in OBGYN, you no longer have to participate in abortions if you have an ethical objection. But let's return to our case of the army medic. Um, there is also, this case is, is, is actually a, uh, uh, for those of you who are fans of Yehoram Gaon, the uh, Israeli singer, there is a song called the Chavesh, um, which is such a profoundly sad song, and it's hard for me to talk about it. I remember um, there are certain songs in Israel that they don't play the entire year. They only play them on Yom HaZikaron, uh, in the, uh, the Israeli Veterans Day, because they're just too sad for the nation to handle. And one of those songs is a song called the Chavesh by Yehoram Gaon. 
and it's the song of a man who is this exact case, a man who is wounded in a line of fire. The chavesh comes out to save him. And as the song goes, very tragically, the chavesh gets shot in the process of saving. And he loses his life and saves the, uh, excuse me, and uh, saves the individual. So this is the case. Um, this is the case here before us. So how many of you think that the chavesh should be obligated to do this kind of thing? So the, you would argue that based on the Bradbaz, that for sure not. He's, he's, uh, his, his risk to life is so high, if you use the simple application of the analysis, the answer is no. He shouldn't be able to, uh, to, to risk his life to do that. He might be considered a chassid shoteh. But that is absolutely not the answer. The answer that Rav Zilberstein gives is this is a very unique case. Why is this case unique? Because not only is it his job, it's not a question of this one soldier saving this one soldier. It's a question of national security and national morale. Now imagine if you're a soldier, and the Israeli army is, is famous for this, if a soldier is if his life is at risk, if he's captured, if he's kidnapped, the, the army goes literally to the ends of the earth to return that soldier. There are soldiers that have been missing for 30, 20, 30 years that they're still actively pursuing on a daily basis. So if you're a soldier fighting in the Israeli army, you know if anything ever happens to you, your colleagues are going to do everything humanly possible to save your life and to get you back. Now, if you're a soldier and you're fighting in the war and you think, you know, if I get shot in the open field, my, my uh, medic is not going to come out to save me. How aggressive are you going to be in battle? You're not going to be very aggressive. So it's not a question of the individual. It's a much larger issue. It's the issue of saving not the individual, literally saving the country. The way this soldier fights and the way the entire army fights depends on the fact that this chavesh is going to risk his life to save the individual. He will, he will do so. The army will fight better. There's a greater chance that Israel will be more successful. Yes. Well, human instinct, well, they, obviously the instinct will guide them in their, their ability to be successful, but instinct wouldn't necessarily play, a, a, in a, in a non-army circumstance, instinct wouldn't necessarily play, play a role. So l the law might override your instinct. Your instinct, you know, some people's instinct is, I'll risk my life to save somebody else. But the law might supersede your instinct in, in certain cases. I mean, I suspect it's pretty similar in the American Army. I don't know if they go to the extent, uh, but the medic is clearly required to go uh, save a soldier in, in open, in open uh, line of fire. I mean, t whether they go to the extent that the Israelis do in bargaining and, and returning their soldiers, perhaps yes. But the Israelis are, are much, more, uh, much more famous because of it. For their, uh, it's tremendous uh, Kiddush Hashem. So let's now bring ourselves to the, uh, to the contemporary context. And that's the, con the context of organ donation. Um, where's Leanna? Leanna, what's our uh, time frame for the second? Uh, about 10 after. About 10 after? Okay, great. Thank you. The, uh, let's talk about organ donation. So we talked about a number of different kinds of organ donation. There is uh, organ donation of blood. Now, how risky is it to donate blood from one individual to another individual? Not risky. So, uh, you know, unless you don't eat your Stelladora cookies, you know, you might faint, but, uh, but there's, there's no life risk. So clearly that's within the category under the rubric of Los Amor al Damriecha, and one is clearly fulfilling a tremendous mitzvah, may even be obligated in limited circumstances to donate blood, if you're, for example, the only match. What about bone marrow? Do you think one, how risky is bone marrow donation? Riskier than blood riskier than blood. And actually here also, this is one of those areas, medicine is one of these areas where you have to reanalyze this, the risk at the time that you're asked the question because the risks are evolving constantly. And medicine is evolving and the risks are getting less and less. So a donation of bone marrow was a riskier procedure, required general anesthesia 10 years ago. Today, and we'll talk about stem cells in section three, you don't even necessarily need to harvest bone marrow. You can just harvest a blood specimen which might have a stem cell in it and you can use that stem cell. You know, which is very limited risk. So very, very uh, limited risk. What about kidney donation? Now, kidney donation is a twofold risk. It's not only the risk of the procedure, 
it's the risk of living the rest of your life with one kidney. Because if you only have one kidney, God created us with two kidneys, two lungs as a backup. If you lose one kidney, you have another one that, that pretty, much, pretty much takes on full function. If you lose one lung, you have another one that pretty much takes on full function. You can live the rest of your life without any problems at all. So it's the risk of living with one kidney. So these are things which have to be assessed from a halachic perspective in order to determine whether one can indeed serve as a kidney donor. And when the question was originally asked in the 1960s, the very first, the frontier of living organ donation, the rabbis invoked this Rabbi David ben Zimra, and they said, I don't know what the risk is like. So far, a couple donors have died. The risk is exceedingly high, it seems, at this stage. So they prohibited people from serving as kidney donors. But now, in 2006, what is the risk to the kidney donor, the living kidney donor? Very, very small for the surgical procedure itself. So therefore, now, there's not one single rabbi that would, that would prohibit living organ donation. It falls squarely within the middle category of David ben Zimra that if you do so, nobody's going to obligate you to donate a kidney, but if you do so, it's tremendous, tremendous act of chesed and a, an extraordinary thing which, uh, which can literally save the life of a human being. And just to share some, some modern cases, I'll get to your question in a moment, um, there was a case in my community, I live in, in Long Island, where somebody put up an org, a, a notice, like a little index card in, sh in, in synagogue and said, uh, seeking an organ donor. Um, and you will find, by the way, in, in most Jewish newspapers, in the Jewish Week, in the Jewish Press, literally on a weekly basis, there are advertisements for, for organ donors. Uh, and no less than six or seven people responded to that card within a week. And one of those ended up being a, a donor, a successful donor. And he made a big kiddish for, his, for, his, uh, for the person who donated the, uh, donated the kidney. This was about a year, a year or so ago. And there's a case which was written up in a book <laughs> In the bottom left-hand corner of your handout, it's called Klayot Yotzot, which is a phrase borrowed from the Talmud. And it's a fa this is the case. It's a, it's a fascinating case. And I happen to know who it is, even though it doesn't mention in the book, because I, the person actually came to Montefiore for some evaluations. But it was a, it, the name I shouldn't divulge, but it was a member of Knesset in Israel who needed, uh, who needed a, a, a kidney donation. And his physicians uh, deemed that he needed a living organ donation, that it would be better for him specifically rather than to get a cadaveric donation. So uh, he had six, uh, six sons, and one of his sons heard that his father needed a living organ donation, so he immediately ran to uh, you know, Hadassah Hospital in Jerusalem and said, I'd like to test myself uh, to see if I'm a match for my father. Um, so then, you know, a couple days later, everybody found out what was going on, and, uh, and the other sons found out that he had gone to test himself, and they were livid. They said, who gives you the right to be the organ donor for our father? We want to be the organ donor for our father. And the firstborn says, I am the Bechor. I am the firstborn. I have rights over all of you. I should be able to be the donor, and I supersede all of you. So they were literally fighting with each other to be the donor for their father, and they didn't know what to do. So they went to a rabbi and they asked him a question. And this entire book is the answer to that question. It's like a 70-page book, which goes to all the analysis of the obligation of honoring your parents, the, whether the, the firstborn has, uh, has rights as well as obligations, and a whole host of things. Um, and what do you think the answer to the question was? So the answer was not take all six, but do a lottery between the firstborn and the individual who went to test himself first. And the firstborn actually won, won, literally won the lottery and uh, was able to serve as a donor to his father. Because there is, a, there is a principle in Jewish law that somebody who begins a mitzvah should be allowed the opportunity to complete the mitzvah. Um, so he had a certain rights by being the, by, uh, by being the zealous one and, uh, and attempting to do so. So organ donation is clearly within the parameters of permissibility in Jewish law from a living human being to another living human being. What about uh, our case of uh, Renata Daniel Patterson? So was it permitted for, for him to donate his first kidney according to Jewish law? Yes. Clearly, categorically permitted. But is he allowed to donate his second kidney? So there, even though it hasn't been asked specifically, the answer would probably be no, because the risk to him is probably too high a risk. Uh, to incur and probably would be shifted into the category of Hasid Shoteh or pious fool of Rav David Ben Zimra and would be prohibited from doing so. I'm sorry? 
Good question. Now, there are, uh, there are more obligations from father to daughter, and that definitely factors into the consideration. But it probably, even though his daughter, probably would be too, too great of a risk for him to, uh, to do so. So in prisoner in jail had had to do with uh, from a, from a uh, ethical analysis because the government would be paying for the transplant, and the government would be paying for him his medical care after the transplant. Now, I didn't discuss that from a luck perspective, but that's that is an issue in the uh, in the secular discussions. And, and no transplant surgeon accepted his uh, his offer. Yes. Uh, that, that's on the excellent question. And that's on the assumption. This is a legal analysis. That's on the assumption that they're all an equal match. Absolutely correct. If one of the sons was a better match, the better match, even though it wasn't the firstborn, it wasn't the person who went, would be the accepted one. And I thank you for for clarifying that. Yes. So the question was, and this is a, a, an excellent question, and one one that I'll, I'll at least initiate an answer. And uh, but I, I don't know if it'll be uh, as satisfactory as you want. Um, but the question was, if if one from a Jewish legal perspective is prohibited from engaging in certain risky or experimental procedures, how do we ever reach a stage of medical success? and reach a stage of proven, tried and true uh, procedures if we are not allowed to embark in the experimental stage of the procedures? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, and the truth is that if it, the entire world was an Orthodox Jewish world in, in a theocratic uh, society, indeed, it, it, uh, it's an interesting question. It, it would be difficult to reach that stage. But it's not that way. And not, the entire world is not bound by the, by the obligations and responsibilities that we have as Orthodox Jews. And these procedures are being done outside the Jewish world context and are being advanced. Um, and it doesn't preclude our ability to benefit from those advances. And it's not hypocritical or contradictory to benefit from those advances. Um, but it is, it is an excellent point and uh, an important point. And actually, maybe here I'll address, someone asked a question at the, uh, at the um, break about, which is a, a loosely related question, about our ability to benefit from research that has been done in a fashion which wouldn't be approved according to Jewish law. That's a follow-up question, and the and in answer to that question, and the classic example, is the uh, is the case of the research done in the Holocaust, which was cl clearly violated every known moral law and ethical law and halachic law. Are we allowed to benefit from those procedures, or not allowed to benefit from those procedures? So clearly, let me let me let me complete this for a moment. The um, so clearly, uh, one would not have sanctioned these prospectively. But once the information is gleaned, once the information is obtained, is it prohibited in, from a Jewish legal perspective to benefit from it? And the answer, there's not an absolute consensus on this, but the answer is generally yes. Once the information has been obtained, there is no violation in the use of the information per se. We would clearly would not have allowed the information to be obtained the way it was, but once we have the information, and that information can potentially save lives, one, one can benefit from that information if the use itself doesn't violate law. So for example, there's a passage in the Talmud of, uh, of a discussion, and it relates to, to embryology and, and genetics to some extent, um, and gender determination. There was a belief in antiquity that the, embryologically the male child completes their development in 40 days and the female child completes their development in 80 days. Um, and they put this to the test. This wasn't an experiment under Jewish auspices, but it, nonetheless it's recorded in the Talmud. It was an experiment under the auspices of Cleopatra. 
in Egypt. What was the experiment? They had, uh, they had their uh, number of her female slaves inseminated, not artificial insemination, but in the natural fashion, become, become pregnant. And they sacrificed them at 40 days and 80 days and opened up the uterus to see what the development of the child was. Now, the Talmud records this, but makes no mention of the fact of the, that it's a heinous experiment which would never have been allowed according to Jewish law, yet it benefits from the information. It, it ultimately actually challenges from an experimental perspective, maybe, you know, maybe it wasn't a controlled experiment and they ask the really scientific questions about the nature of the experiment. But one of the comments which is, which is uh, um, clearly absent and, uh, and of note is that they don't comment on the fact that it was done uh, in, in an immoral fashion. So they, they attempt to benefit even though the experiment was done in an immoral fashion. Obviously there are many other sources, um, but the bottom line is, if the use of the information itself, after it's been obtained, does not violate any Jewish law, uh, it's, it's permitted to use. And, and similar related topics include using aborted fetuses for, for transplantation and for research, and a whole host of other things. You know, you know actually, I apologize, I'm going to hold questions for a moment, um, and uh, we'll, we'll take a break now. I'd like, after the break, just to finish up for five or ten minutes some fascinating issues of uh, just to at least cover the cadaveric organ donation, because that's very important, and then we'll move into the uh, future. Higher authority. Before we start back up, I would just like to remind you all that I've put out evaluations and we would very much appreciate it if we could have your feedback and you hand it to me on the way out at the end when we finish at 1.30. In addition, if there's anybody else that would like an Everett Institute brochure, please either raise your hand, let me know, and I'm, I'm happy to hand them out. Terrific. I'll be right there. And then... Uh, Finally, there's, there, are, there are people here that have uh, made, it, m made it aware that uh, they would very much like to get together with other people, perhaps medical professionals, that are interested in starting a discussion group or, or, or talking about this subject. So um, it, we're really not in the position of handing out people's names and, and contact information, but if that is something that you are interested in um, after the institute is over at 1.30, if you want to form a little group by the, by the piano, um, you can meet some people who are interested in, in similar, similar things. So, so please take, your, um, take advantage of that. Enjoy the rest of the institute.
Uh, just a word of apology. I, uh, I apologize that I have to be pretty prompt in my uh, departure at 1.30. Um, I know there have been a lot of wonderful questions, and I thank you all for your questions. What I'd like to do is give you my email, which you're all welcome to, uh, to use. Um, and the email is as follows. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, my wife's name is Sarah, S-A-R-A, -A, the letter N, E-D-D-I-E, S-A-R-A-N-E-D-D-I-E, -D -D -E at uh, optonline.net, O-P-T-O-N, L-I-N-E dot N-E-T. It's on Long Island, right? All right, it's a Long Island address. The, um, and I'm actually going to be out of town for a few weeks, so if you don't hear from me for a few days, don't uh, fear not. I will uh, I'll be happy to respond at, at my earliest, uh, earliest possibility. S-A-R-A-N-E-D-D-I-E -E at optonline dot N-E-T. Serenetti, correct. <laughs> um, so I'd just like to, uh, to finish off for a few minutes the, uh, the cadaveric donation, and then we'll shift into the future, back to the future. The, um, you have here in your handout for cadaveric organ donation some of the, uh, a, a, a pasuk, a sentence from Yechezkel, from Ezekiel, which, according to some, is the very first organ transplant which ever took place in the history of mankind. And it reads, I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit. I will place within you. Um, and I will remove the uh, stone heart, the heart which is uh, filled with uh, plaques of uh, cholesterol, uh, from your uh, from your flesh, and I'll place a, uh, a heart of flesh, a heart transplant. So this is the biblical allusion uh, to the uh, to the very first uh, the very first heart transplant. Um, now the issues in cadaveric donation are significantly different from live organ donation. And part of the reason is, with living organ donation. You have an individual who has obligations, who has risks. With cadaveric donation, once somebody dies, they are no longer obligated in lo ta'amor al dam re'echa. They are no longer obligated in any mitzvos. Actually, the term for someone once they have died is chafshi, chafshi b'mitzvos. They are, they are free from all, uh, all, uh, all obligations. So then what are the issues related to cadaveric donation? The issues relate to the same issues we talked about from uh, Rav David Ben Zimra, and the same issues of uh, the Nodu Bihuder, Bechezka Landau, in the first uh, case of autopsy back in the 1700s. You have obligations and prohibitions that devolve upon the Jewish body, and those include the prohibition against desecration of the body, the prohibition against deriving benefit from the body in any way, shape, or form, and the obligation to bury the body. Uh, and these derive from the, uh, from the Torah, from Devarim. I have it uh, here in your handout. Um, and I'll read it in Hebrew in the trans and translate. It says, Lo Talin, reading from the Pasuk Chav Gimel, number 23. Lo Talin, Nivlato Al Ha'etz. And the context here is actually a capital crime, but it's been extrapolated by the rabbinic authorities. After a capital crime, the body gets corpse gets hung on a uh, tree as a deterrent. So people can see as they walk by, this is somebody who is sentenced to a capital crime, and they should not do such a crime. But even though it's a deterrent, the Torah says you must remove that body by the end of the day. You can't let it stay there for days or weeks. Why is that? Because even though the person is deceased, and even though it's required for a deterrent, there is still an embodiment of God in the human being even after life, even in death. And then it continues, Ki kavortik berenu bayom hahu, you must bury that body that very day. And in the Jewish tradition, we are very particular about, about immediate burial. The only way we will delay burial is if it's for the honor of the deceased. So if someone is traveling from a far off place that uh, will clearly honor the deceased with their presence at the funeral, for that we will delay the, the burial. But in Jerusalem, which is not practiced here in the United States, they are very particular about burial. They bury 24 hours a day. 
In the United States, they will always wait to the next day if somebody passes at night. In Israel, if they die at one in the morning, they bury at three in the morning. They do not wait. Kavor tik berenu by yom hahu, unless of course there's a there's a reason which is an honor to the uh, to the deceased to wait. Um, so then the issue is relate to these particular prohibitions and obligations, but then there's another very important issue, which is really the crux of the issue in organ donation, and that is the issue of the definition of death. Now you, how may, may you, you may ask, does that relate it? Because we live in a very funny world. There are two types of dead people in the 21st century. There's heart-beating cadavers, and there's non-heart-beating cadavers. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is this new definition of brain death, relatively new definition. If one would have lived, say, 60, 70 years ago, and God forbid would have had a massive heart attack, there would be no blood supplied to the brain, and the brain would invariably die, and the centers of the brain which control breathing would not be functioning and it would all happen within a relatively short period of time. And the converse was also true. If you had a massive stroke which, which affected your brain centers which control breathing, you would stop breathing, there'd be no oxygen to the, to the heart, and the heart would stop in a very short period of time. But this is not the case anymore. Now we have the dissociation between cardiac death and brain death. And how did that dis dissociation occur, occur? That occurred by virtue of one d novel device, which is very common in the practice of medicine, and that device is the respirator or ventilator or life support machine. And what that machine does is it's a plastic tube which is delivered into the trachea of the individual and delivers oxygen, oxygen supply. Now, in a particular case, and it's very limited cases, I, I emphasize, of people who, who succumb to this condition called brain death. It's not that every human being that dies, dies of brain death. Far, far, far from it. There's a small percentage of people who will sustain trauma or serious disease to the brain, and they will have brain death. The classic case is a motor vehicle accident where someone sustains major head trauma. And they'll sustain death of the brain. They will be put on a breathing machine the, the machine will deliver oxygen, and the heart will continue to pump, and the blood pressure will be maintained, even though there is no connection to the brain at all. The brain center that controls oxygen, that controls breathing, is completely non-functional. If you remove the respirator from that individual, he has no spontaneous breathing, and and would st and the heart would stop beating within a few minutes. But it's this unique case of the brain-dead individual that is res largely responsible for the development of organ transplantation. Now, why is that? The reason that is is because once a person's heart stops in the natural form of death, in the non-brain death form of death, the oxygen stops flowing to all parts of the body. And once oxygen stops flowing, the tissue begins to decompose. Tissue begins to decompose. It's no longer viable to transplant into another human being. But in this case of brain death, you have someone whose brain is not functioning, but whose heart is functioning, whose heart is pumping blood to the other organs in the body, and the other organs of the body are functioning. And if the person, if, you know, the tragic, sad case is a young, healthy person who has head trauma, and the rest of his organs are, are perfectly fine. And these are the patients that are being used for transplanting. And the organs, the lion's share of organs, hearts, livers, lungs, kidneys, they all come from these patients who are in this, this situation of brain death. So the question is, from a halachic perspective, how does Jewish law define death? Does Jewish law accept this relatively new definition of brain death? Now, secular society, it took a number of years, but they, they have almost universally, I think Japan just accepted brain death a handful of years ago, but in generally in the Western cultures, we have accepted brain death as legal death, and if someone sustains brain death, they are buried. The, the respirator is removed, and they stopped, uh, and if transplantation is an option, they are kept on the breathing machine and, until which time the organs are harvested, and then they're, uh, and then they're buried. So uh, does Jewish law accept this definition of death, or does it not accept this definition of death? Now let me ask you, of all the patients that have been diagnosed with this new condition, brain death, how many of them can theoretically, uh, how many of them have in the past regained consciousness and left the hospital? Absolutely none, 0.0. 0. 
notwithstanding the cases in the Star and the Inquirer that you may read. So those, those cases are not definitive diagnoses of brain death. Those are people who are misdiagnosed. Um, and, and the truth is that the misdiagnosis of death is not a new problem. It's an old problem. And it's a problem which has faced the Jewish community in the past as well. There's a very famous historical chapter in the 1800s of the concern of premature burial. And there was a belief that people were being misdiagnosed as being dead. Uh, and uh, as a result, in the certain communities in Europe, there was a law, a secular law, by the governments that no human being who died within their districts was allowed to be buried for three days, lest there be a misdiagnosis of death. And once three days, rigor mortis had begun to set in, the body had be, uh, become gangrenous, then it was pretty clear that the person had passed and then expired, so then they would allow burial. And this presented a serious halachic problem, because we just said a minute ago, you have to bury the body immediately. Are you allowed to delay burial for three days? You know, isn't that a desecration of the body to delay the burial for three days, even though your concern is that the person might be alive? So there were extensive discussions about what exactly diagnoses death. Is it the respiration which determines death? Is it cardiac activity which determines death? So there's a whole host of extensive discussions. And just to, sh to share with you a fascinating entrepreneurial approach to preventing premature burials, the picture in your handout <clears throat> is a picture of somebody buried underground hooked up to an intricate pulley system um, with uh, with strings on their toes and strings on their fingers and a, and a string around the head. And should they move underground, it's hooked up to a bell on the top of the grave, which would ring, hence the term, saved by the bell. It's, that's really where it came from. It's not just the boxing uh, association. That's really where the term saved by the bell came from. So the... Uh, there was a tremendous fear in 19th century Europe about premature burial and it finds its expression in literature. There's an Edgar Allan Poe story about, uh, about premature burial. You'll find it in other uh, famous literary figures. Um, they scared the daylights out of everybody um, and that they were going to be buried alive. And that's why these laws evolved about keeping people above ground for, uh, for three days. And that was... You know, in the history of Jewish law and medicine, this was one of the major, major controversies. And every major Jewish figure at that time weighed in on whether it was permitted to keep above ground or not keep above ground. Yes? The, uh, the question was, did the invention of the stethoscope change that at all? The, well, it's not specifically the stethoscope, although the stethoscope clearly was a, a, a factor in that. Um, the stethoscope was actually introduced into the, in the 1700s by René Lenec, who was a Frenchman. It actually didn't reach the English-speaking countries for a while because nobody could speak French. So they were using it in France, but uh, nobody, nobody used it in, in the, in the uh, English-speaking world. The person who was responsible for introducing it into uh, practice in, uh, in Guy's Hospital in London, and then it became very popular, was uh, Thomas Hodgkin uh, of Hodgkin's disease. Uh, introduced the stethoscope into, uh, and he actually had a, uh, you know, he, he, the original stethoscope was not what you know uh, today, obviously. Uh, he had a problem of modesty with his female patients, uh, and that's, that was the impetus for the development of the stethoscope. And he originally took, literally took a piece of paper and rolled it up and put his ear to the paper and then, the, and then to the chest and found that there was transmitted sound. You could actually hear relatively well. So he, uh, this then developed into a wooden stethoscope, and the early wooden stethoscopes of René Lenec are just wooden tubes that transmit sounds. And, and then he had a friend who was a pathologist who correlated the sounds that he heard to the pathology of the lungs after the patients had died. And then obviously it's taken off uh, and it's got its own history since then. But, but it's not just the stethoscope, it's the understanding of respiratory and cardiac physiology and anatomy and the ability to diagnose death um, uh, and more effectively is, uh, has definitely evolved and, and definitely factors into the consideration. So there are a number of rabbinic sources which discuss these issues. And, uh, and the, uh, suffice it to say, I'll share with you one of, the, uh, one of the sources actually. On the bottom of this page, it comes from the Tractate in Yoma. 
And in, in Yoma, it's a, it's a discussion, and this is relevant, unfortunately, in our modern day as well. Uh, if a building collapses, now generally, obviously, if a building collapses, you're obligated to do what you can to save the lives of everybody in the building. But let's say it happens to be Sabbath. Are you allowed to violate Sabbath to save the life of a human being? The answer is a categorical yes, and we'll talk about that in a moment when we talk about stem cells as well. But the minute you are confident that the person is dead, you no longer have the license to violate the Sabbath. So at what point is that? So that's this passage. A rabbi is taught, how far does one have to search? So you're uncovering the body, and there's a debate whether you're uncovering the body head first or, or feet first. And, you're, uh, and you reach the nose. So some say, you know, until you reach the nostrils. And how do they determine via the nostrils whether the person was alive or not? They'd use either a feather or a mirror to see if there was a clouding of the mirror, see if there's any, any uh, steaming up of the mirror. And some say um, up to the heart. You have to uncover up to the heart, presumably to see if there's any uh, either chest cavity movement or if there's any uh, pulsations of the heart. Now, it's a little anachronistic to talk about pulse in the times of the Talmud. This is the fifth century. The use of the pulse in the practice of medicine was a much, much uh, later development, although obviously they knew of its, of its existence. So um, if one searches and finds those above to be dead, one must not assume those below are surely dead. Uh, regarding the saving of life, he would agree that life manifests itself through the nose especially, as it is written, in whose nostrils was the breath of, of the spirit of life. So this, this Talmudic uh, passage, which is the source of literally hundreds of responsa in the discussion of, of organ transplantation, is used as a, uh, as a source to determine how death is, is diagnosed. And it's not, uh, I wish I could give you a very simple interpretation, it, it's actually far, far more complex. And actually interpreted this, this passage has been interpreted variously by different people, some actually using it as a support that respiration is the prime determinant of, of life, because the conclusion is that it's the nostrils which determine. And, uh, and the modern understanding of the control of respiration is the brain. And since respiration was the determinant, and we know that if the brain is non-functioning and there's complete and absolute irreversible function of the brain, there is no spontaneous respiration. So that our modern interpretation would be that brain death would be considered legal death. And others counter and say that in this Talmudic passage, the respiration is simply a manifestation of cardiac function. And that in the absence of cardiac function, someone would be dead. But if there's any cardiac function, even though the brain is dead, some would be considered alive. And what's the halachic significance? The halachic significance, obviously, is the ability to transplant. We mentioned pikuach nefesh. You're allowed to save the life of a human being. What's one of the laws you're not allowed to violate to save a human being? You're not allowed to kill somebody else to save a human being. So the question is, is this person legally alive or is he not alive? So according to the rabbis who maintain that this person is legally dead, that respiration is the determinant, then you're allowed to invoke the, the responsum of the no de Behuda who said, if there's a sick person who will directly and immediately benefit from this, you're allowed to violate the prohibition of desecrating the body and uh, the burial of the body. And is there, in the case of organ transplantation, somebody who will directly and immediately benefit? Take a look at the front page. How many thousands of people are waiting for organs every single day? The answer is yes. You harvest that organ, the individual will be able to benefit directly and immediately within a few days to receive an organ in a life-saving fashion. So isn't the body being desecrated by removing the organ? So the answer is it is not a desecration if it's used for pikuach nefesh. That's the answer. But if you maintain, as some rabbis do, that the, this individual is legally alive until the heart stops functioning, then it's considered homicide and you are not allowed to serve as an organ donor. This is as widespread a debate and as intense a debate as the debate about the three-day burial in the past centuries and remains so to this very day. And I put on your handout, I believe I put on your handout on the front page, the Halachic Organ Donor Society which I am on the board of, actually. And, it's, uh, and I encourage you, if you want more information, there's a wealth of articles and literature at that website, um, www.hods, Halachic Organ Donor Society, .org. Uh, it remains a debate. Some rabbis will allow organ donation and accept the brain death criteria as legal death. Some rabbis do not accept it and will not allow the harvesting of organs. Yes? The, 
the, there are actually some Talmudic passages, specifically those kinds of cases, where one is allowed, uh, allowed to perform uh, autopsy for, to potentially exonerate a criminal. From, from the death penalty. So each case has to be analyzed on its own merits, but there are exceptions to the general rule that autopsy should not be performed. So widespread autopsies on a routine basis are clearly not allowed within the confines of Jewish law. However, if, if uh, there is a contagious disease which people don't understand, or there's a genetic condition that an autopsy will benefit living relatives, or if someone has a, a miscarriage or a stillbirth, that uh, might benefit future pregnancies. All those kinds of cases have been allowed on a case-by-case -case basis for, for the pro Yes, yes. We have an ability to donate our temporal bones which contain the ear at the time of death. And there's a temporal bone series of banks at major teaching institutions where uh, the pathology to the auditory system was studied but the temporal bone cannot be used to restore hearing in another human being. It can only be used for research to better understand various auditory disorders. Is that allowed? So the, the question was, is the donation of the temporal bone, which is used for research to better understand hearing and potentially benefit those who have hearing deficit to gain hearing, would, some, would that kind of donation be allowed? There's two sides of the coin of organ donation. There's the, the uh, risks to the individual and the, and the halachic things which can be overridden for, for the individual. And then there's the pikuach nefesh element of the recipient. Now the requirement, the threshold for allowing the violation of all the laws has to be that the individual has a life-threatening condition and it has to be used for clinical purposes. So donating for res any research that's not a direct clinical application. So if you're going to tell me this temporal bone is transplanted into somebody who will hear, which obviously at this stage it's not, then I would say, and even that, by the way, hearing loss has to be discussed whether hearing loss is considered a life-threatening condition. And the answer to that very well may be yes, but it has to be discussed. So for example, blindness. What about cornea donation? So there's a discussion. Someone who clearly, the clear cases are heart transplant. Someone has heart dysfunction. He's going to die within a few weeks or months, maybe even less, without a heart transplant. So that clearly is pikuach nefesh for the recipient. Liver. If you have fulminant liver failure, you cannot survive with liver failure. You will invariably die. Kidney disease. Kidney disease, you won't die. You can live for years on dialysis. Does that meet the criteria for pikuach nefesh? So there is a discussion, and as we said, even though it is true, the person can live longer, there's still a much higher incidence of stroke, of heart attack on dialysis. Listen, they wouldn't be alive without it, but it's still a higher risk existence and is justified. But, to, but, to don't, but what about the cornea? So corneas, um, the, the, uh, there is extensive discussions, and the rabbis basically say since, since blindness is potentially harm to the individual, and the, not only that, the harvesting of the cornea from the, from, the, from the deceased may not even be a desecration of the body. Because when the eyes are closed, the, uh, you don't even see that the cornea has been harvested. So there's many, many factors that go in, the desecration from the body and the, the nature of pikuach nefesh for the recipient. So some have argued also in a very creative fashion that in, in the, uh, the violation is to desecrate, um, to desecrate the dead. But when you take an organ and insert it into an individual, it becomes reanimated in that individual. So you're no longer benefiting from the corpse. You have reanimated an organ. It's no longer a dead body. Uh, and we talked about the co I don't know if we mentioned this, by mumya, there were discussions about whether a cohane could, could trade in the substance. He, and I believe, we, I believe we mentioned this. And there are discussions about whether cohane can receive an organ transplant. Because a cohane is receiving, is in contact with the, with the material from a corpse. So invariably the answer is, because it's pikuach nefesh for the cohane, he's obviously allowed to do it. But an additional support is the fact that the organ is reanimated, it may not be a dead the dead tissue that he's that he's benefiting from, yes. There is. There is discussions. The, the question was, which is an excellent question, is there a difference whether the person has blindness in one eye or blindness in both eyes? And yes, there is a discussion about may, there might be a distinction in those uh, in those cases. Um, yes.
That is correct. Years, maybe 15, and then they eventually will get all the side effects. And the, you know, I mean, it's, it, it is a death sentence. It's just a longer death sentence than tomorrow. Agreed, agreed. That is, that is an excellent point. Yes. Mm -hmm. Where the husband said she's been brain dead for 15 years and the parents said she's not brain dead. And there seemed to be some question until an autopsy was performed as to which, who was correct. I, I'm glad, I'm, I'm sorry, you, I'm sorry, go ahead. Ariel Sharon, I mean, he's kind of uh, heading in a direction where there might be a question mark. I, I thank you. I mean, the truth is one of the areas which I, uh, I, we didn't do here is, is a general end of life discussion about treatment at the end of life. But you mentioned uh, the, the question was how do you, how do we categorize Terry Shivo, and even how do we categorize El Sharon in terms of their status, their life status, their brain death status? That's an excellent question, and there is a tremendous amount of misunderstanding and misinformation about the definition of death and what brain death means. People are under the impression, which is not true, that com comatose patients are brain dead. That is absolutely not true. And thank you for allowing me to clarify. Someone who is brain dead is a very restricted, very limited case of someone who, by definition, has to be on a respirator. If the respirator is moved, they have no independent breathing whatsoever. The brain has been tested to be not connected to the body. There is no brain flow to the brain. The brain has begun to decompose. Um, and it's a very limited case. All these other cases, like Terry Schiavo, Terry Schiavo and she, her category is considered a persistent vegetative state, and the acronym is PVS. Physicians like to give acronyms to everything. PVS means that she has no consciousness, but she has spontaneous breathing. She had. She was not connected to a respirator. She was breathing completely on her own. Uh, and she was in a state of constant coma or persistent coma, not at all in a state of, of, of brain death. Now, the debate about her, the nature of her brain was really the nature of her consciousness. The husband argued that while she had some grimacing or some facial expressions, they were of no consequence or no meaning, that she really had no brain function. They were just muscular movements with no meaning behind them whatsoever. And the family argued with creative filming and neurologists that were testifying that she, that she indeed had some kind of communication, some kind of interaction. They performed the autopsy. Subsequently, you found that her brain was pretty much completely liquefied, uh, which was probably more support to the husband's position than to, than to the family's position. But be that as it may, she was in a state of, uh, of persistent vegetative state. She was not in any way, shape, or form brain dead and, and never achieved a state of brain dead. Um, in Jewish law, while we're not talking about this, I must clarify this uh, as you mentioned it, um, while Jewish law would argue and some would agree that brain dead is halachically dead, the persistent vegetative state, according to all Jewish authorities, is not is not near death or, or and not, a, not a patient that you could ever withhold food from or feeding or antibiotics or other types of things. Um, it's, sad, it's a sad and tragic case. It happens more often in the young, but she was an otherwise healthy woman who had no consciousness. She didn't have a terminal condition. She had a chronic condition. Um, you know, I apologize, actually, I'm, I'm going to hold the questions and just uh, shift, uh, shift into, the, um, into, our next, uh, into our next segment. The, uh, actually, any extra handouts? I don't have one for the uh, third hand. So we've talked about issues of the past uh, and history of mumia and, uh, and, uh, and anatomical dissection and autopsy and the seven-chambered uterus. We've talked about uh, issues of the present, organ donation, living organ donation, cadaveric organ donation. We now shift into the, uh, the cusp of the future and what is clearly going to occupy us into the, uh, into the next few decades. Um, and that's the issue of, uh, of genetics and the understanding of the human cell and stem cell research. Um, and we've come so far, in fact, in our research that a scientist has had the audacity to approach God and to say, God, you know, I'm not so sure we need you anymore. We can do just about everything you can do. We can even create man just like you did at the beginning. So the uh, God says to the scientist, is that so? How do you do such a thing? 
So he says, well, you know, we take some dirt from the ground and we uh, take it to the laboratory and we use a pipette and we uh, take the molecules and we arrange them in different ways and we uh, create a human being. So God says, please show me. So the scientist proceeds to bend down and pick up the dirt and God says, no, 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 you get your own dirt. <laughs> Aha. So despite the fact that uh, scientists believe they can control everything and do everything, we as uh, Jews realize that there is a God above us uh, who divines all the things that we do. Uh, and that's really part of our discussion here is to see how, uh, how Jewish law uh, interrelates with these very fascinating and uh, continually evolving developments in the fields of, uh, of medicine and science. Um, for the remainder of our discussion, what I'd like to do is, uh, is briefly share with you uh, the life of a uh, fictional family. And I won't, uh, obviously there's a lot of sources in this handout, we won't have time to go through every source inside, but share with, share with you some of the uh, issues related to a fictional family in the field of genetics in the, in the, in the year 2006 that they might approach, or that they might uh, encounter um, as, they, as they go through their lives. And we'll begin with a, a, a couple whom we will call uh, Jacob and Leah. And uh, Jacob and Leah are a young couple about to be married. He's 25 and she's 23. And, uh, and their parents say, you know, we heard about this uh, genetic testing for couples before they get married. Maybe you guys should, uh, should consider some genetic testing. And I know there's at least one geneticist here in the audience uh, uh, today. Feel free to, uh, to interject if there's any, uh, any clarifications. Um, and this is their very first encounter with the field of genetics as a young couple. So they say, first of all, you know, should we bother doing such a thing? I don't really know anyone in the family who has genetic diseases. What are, what are all these genetic diseases? Why should we even bother testing? So Rabbi Moshe Feinstein was asked a number of years ago when Tay-Sachs was a very prevalent disease, he said, should we test for, uh, should people test that are about uh, you know, to embark on, on relationships? And he said that one might argue, you know, take your, take your chances, God will protect me. You know, walk simply in the ways of God and, uh, and, uh, and everything will be fine. Uh, but he says, no. He says, if it's a test which is easily done and can potentially save you from tremendous anguish and, uh, and stress and sorrow, both for you as parents and for the child that's born, then one should indeed test for such a thing. And he encouraged people to test for the diseases. And there is an organization here in New York, and it's actually now an international organization, which some of you may or may not have heard of. It's called Dor Yasharim. Uh, it's an organization which tests, does genetic testing in, uh, for the uh, largely Ashkenazi Jewish community. Uh, it was actually started by a Hasidic fellow named uh, Rabbi Eckstein. Uh, who, uh, very similar, I don't know if you recall, in our smallpox section, we talked about that, uh, that book which was written by a man who had suffered uh, losses, personal losses, uh, to children who suffered smallpox, who died of smallpox. This man, Rabbi Eckstein, lost four children to Tay-Sachs disease. And he took it upon himself to start an organization which would test people to prevent this from happening to anybody else. And that's what he did. Now his, his testing is a unique testing which actually is targeted more specifically for the ultra-Orthodox community, the Hasidic community. And why do I say that? Because it's anonymous testing. And how is it done? It's done in the following way. Uh, men and women will submit blood to the uh, to Dor Yasharim and then they will receive a number. There is never a name associated with that specimen ever. There's only a number associated with the specimen. If those people, if you have a man and a woman that sometime later want to marry, they will each submit their numbers to Dor Yasharim. Dor Yasharim will then look at both numbers and see if they are a genetic match or if they are a genetic mismatch. Mismatch means that they are both carriers of recessive genes for particular conditions. Now, Dor Yasharim tests for about 10 to 15 conditions at this stage. They're always adding tests. They test for Tay-Sachs disease, Canavan's disease, Bloom syndrome, uh, familial dysautonomia, um, cystic fibrosis, and, uh, and a handful of others um, that they're testing for. And they will determine whether the people are matched. And I actually spoke at a forum with Rabbi Eckstein about a month ago, and he said over the decade, maybe decade or two that they've been doing this, they have found, I think it was roughly 500 genetic mismatches. That, um, out of tens of thousands, probably, that have been tested. 
I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was uh, it was a lot. There's a lot that they've tested, and they found about 500 mismatches. So they strongly suggest that the people should not get married. Now we'll talk about options and and, and things uh, that can be done in this in this uh, in this day and age, and that's part of the excitement of living in this age, the excitement and the challenge of living in this age. So this couple, Jacob and Leah, they decide to go for the testing because that's what's recommended by their parents, and they go to Dorya Sharim, and they submit their numbers, and lo and behold, they get a phone call. The phone call is, you are a genetic mismatch. You are both carriers for Tay-Sachs disease. And Rabbi Eckstein has said on many occasions that many people who are Tay-Sachs carriers don't even have Tay-Sachs in the family. They would never even know that they're Tay-Sachs carriers. But it just so happened that these two young people were actually Tay-Sachs carriers. And Doria Shorim strongly recommends that they do not get married because there is a one in four chance that every child, for every single child, is an independent one in four chance that that child will have Tay-Sachs disease. Tay-Sachs disease is a uniformly fatal disease. Every child with Tay-Sachs will invariably die within a relatively short period of time, say four or five years of age. It's a horrible, horrible disease. And parenthetically, because of Rabbi Eckstein's efforts, literally because of this one man's efforts, the incidence of Tay-Sachs has dropped to almost zero in the New York area. From, from 15, 20, 30 years ago, where every pediatric hospital had in their units a, a handful of Tay-Sachs patients, you will be hard-pressed to find even one Tay-Sachs patient in any hospital in the New York area. Is that from termination of pregnancy? That is from prevention of marriage. Not from termination. Now, termination of pregnancy might factor into that as well. But from, his, from what he has done in the religious community, most of whom aren't performing abortions, and we'll talk about that exactly in a moment, it's probably more from prevention of, of marriage than, from, uh, than from, uh, from abortion. Although abortion clearly factors into that as well. Yes? <laughs> Uh, the question was, uh, it, the, the couple could marry and then use artificial insemination donor. Uh, now, I'm actually involved. We didn't. One topic we did not discuss is the issue of assisted reproduction in Jewish law. I'm actually involved now at Yeshiva University in a course in training rabbis to gain understanding in the issues of assisted reproduction in Jewish law. And this is like a semester-long course dealing with issues exactly like this, artificial insemination, artificial insemination using donor. Now, artificial insemination with donor is, uh, I don't want to take us far afield because it'll, it'll take us, it'll take us uh, a field, but by and large, whereas other religions don't accept interference in the reproductive process, Jewish law is accepting of it as long as it doesn't violate any prohibitions or any laws. Um, in artificial insemination, there are issues which need to be addressed. So the harvesting of the male seed and how it's harvested is addressed in Jewish law. Uh, the definition of paternity in cases of artificial insemination, is the donor considered the legal father or not, are addressed in Jewish law. Is one allowed to use a donor, which some argue at the end of the day, it's a married woman conceiving the child of another man, is that considered adultery, and is the child considered a legal bastard as a result, a mamzer? Uh, the, there's a wealth of issues and discussion that relate to that. Now, there are rabbis who may allow artificial insemination donor, but that's in a case of male infertility. This is not a case of male infertility, and we'll talk about other options. That's exactly the, our discussion. What other options does this couple have? So this couple now are engaged to be married. They hear all the encouragement or dis discouragement from Doria Sharm to marry, and they proceed anyway. They decide they wanted to get married. What are their options now? You know, I don't know. I apologize. I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know if they released the disorder. I don't want to, to, to answer incorrectly. Um, so they decide that they, uh, that, they don't want, that they want to marry. So now, a year later, uh, Rivka's pregnant. And um, I'm sorry, Leah. Leah's pregnant. <laughs> can understand the slip. And, uh, and Leah's pregnant. And, uh, and, and, and now they remember that discussion they had with Doria Sharm a year ago. And they're starting to panic. They say, you know, there's a one in four chance that this baby that I'm carrying is, is afflicted with Tay-Sachs. What am I going to do? 
So what does is, what is Jewish law say in terms of the options? So in terms of contemporary medical science, there are, in essence, two ways that they can determine with certainty whether this child has Tay-Sachs or does not have Tay-Sachs, either amniocentesis or chorionic villus sampling. Chorionic villus sampling, and we don't need to go into the details of the procedures, but they both will harvest some genetic material from the uh, either from around the fetus or from from the uh, the area that, that they will be able to determine what the genetic makeup is of the fetus. They can determine in good hands with certainty that this child has Tay-Sachs disease or does not have Tay-Sachs disease. Question one: Are they allowed to do this procedure in Jewish law? Question two, if they find out that the child is indeed afflicted with Tay-Sachs, are they allowed to act on these results according to Jewish law? So the two questions are interrelated. So according to one position, so for example, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, who maintains that, uh, he maintains that abortion for fetal indication, which means that abortion for a fetus that has any malformation or deformity is prohibited according to Jewish law. Consequently, and because you're not going to be able to abort the child in his eyes, one is not allowed to do the amniocentesis or the chorionic villus sampling because those procedures have a, a risk, albeit a small risk, of inducing spontaneous miscarriage or causing deformity in the child. So he doesn't allow that. But abortion, again, which we could spend, obviously, a wealth of time just discussing the legal aspects of abortion, abortion is generally frowned upon in Jewish law, but it is not agreed upon what the exact prohibition of abortion is. There are varying approaches about the nature of prohibition. Rav Moshe Feinstein is of the strictest, who maintains that abortion is akin to homicide. Not exactly homicide, but akin to homicide. And we mentioned before with the distinction between Jew and non-Jew, if a Jew performs an abortion, he cannot be sentenced to death in a court of law. But, according to Rav Moshe Feinstein, it's still associated with homicide and therefore prohibited under circumstances unless the mother's life is at risk. The mother's life is at risk, then you're allowed to perform an abortion. On the other polar extreme, you have the Tzitz Eliezer of Eliezer Waldenberg, who is a, a prominent rabbinic authority who lives in Jerusalem today, who allowed abortion in the case of Tay-Sachs disease up to the seventh month of pregnancy. So obviously, according to him, it would be allowed to perform a chorionic villa sampling or amniocentesis. And factoring in his discussion, were A, that he doesn't hold it to be akin to homicide, he holds the prohibition of abortion to be uh, another, another prohibition, like uh, torts and, uh, and bodily harm or damage, but not necessarily homicide. And also he takes into consideration the life of the child and the life of the parents and the tremendous physical distress, I'm sorry, psychological and emotional distress that would cause the parents for this kind of, uh, this kind of situation. And he is the polar extreme. There are, there are those who are in, in the middle. I apologize, actually, I'm going to hold on questions in the interest of time, and, and I hope I'll be able to answer some questions in a few moments. The, um, so they get a, uh, they, they go to, a, uh, to the Tzitz Eliezer, to Eliezer of Aldenburg. Their rabbi is connected with him, and they, they present the question to him, and he allows them to perform the amniocentesis. And they perform the amniocentesis, and, uh, and thankfully they find out that the child is not a, a care, and doesn't have both recessive genes for Tay-Sachs disease. The child does not have Tay-Sachs. Um, and they give birth to a healthy baby girl. So... This young couple now, Jacob and Leah, a year or two passes, and they're thinking of conceiving again. And they said, you know, we had such a tremendously stressful time with that previous conception about whether we should do amniocentesis, not do amniocentesis, whether we should abort, not abort. It was so uh, heart-wrenching and so devastating. Maybe we shouldn't have another child altogether. Maybe we should just uh, forget about uh, having other children. So what other options are available to them now? Well, there's a new and extraordinarily exciting option that's available to them, uh, w the ramifications of which uh, we will only see in the, in the near future. And that's a, a procedure which is called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, a relatively new procedure. In this procedure, one can combine, it requires in vitro fertilization, assisted reproduction, it requires harvesting the male sperm, the male seed and the female seed and, and fertilizing it in the laboratory. Uh, then allowing, actually on the, on the front page of, your, of this handout, you'll see a picture of, of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. 
it's obviously not a one-to-one -one, uh, image. It's magnified significantly. The, uh, the embryo will, is allowed to grow to an eight cell stage, and then at the eight cell stage, they remove one of those eight cells and send it to the laboratory for genetic analysis. And whatever is understood at the, in medicine at the time that the test is done, they can determine the genetics. So they can obviously determine the sex of the child, uh, and they can determine with, in good hands with certainty that the child is afflicted with Tay-Sachs or not afflicted with Tay-Sachs in addition to a whole host of other things. So the question is, in Jewish law, is one allowed to avail themselves of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or not? So here, uh, we had actually t touched on this a moment ago in your question about assisted reproduction. Generally, a couple is not allowed to use in vitro fertilization unless they suffer from infertility. And these, these prohibitions involved in harvesting the reproductive seed are generally pushed aside because one could fulfill the obligation to be fruitful and multiply. Uh, so you'll, uh, you know, we find ways to procure the sperm in, in, hal in halakhically non-objectionable fashion, and, uh, and rabbis would generally allow that kind of procedure. But this is not that kind of case. This, this couple is not infertile. They could conceive naturally. So are they allowed to avail, them, avail themselves of assisted reproduction just in order to produce a child that won't be afflicted with a genetic disease? And the answer is, and this is very new technology, very new halakhic literature also, the answer is yes. The rabbis have allowed in restricted circumstances to avail yourselves of this pre-implantation genetic diagnosis for the sole purpose of creating an embryo which will not be afflicted with a disease, and here it's a relatively simple case because it's a, a fatal disease, Tay-Sachs, where it will become complicated in the future is which diseases are you going to allow pre-implantation genetic diagnosis for, which are you not? Are you going to allow for predisposition to disease? Are you going to allow it for gene cancer genes? If you have cancer genes in the family for colon cancer, breast cancer, are you going to allow those kinds of things? We'll talk about, uh, we'll talk about that in, in just a moment. Um, for Down syndrome, for 10 other diseases, for predisposition to diabetes, to high blood pressure, are you going to, are you going to use uh, assisted reproduction to, to produce a child? You could very easily envision a society where, you know, sexual intercourse is one aspect of relationship and procreation is another aspect of relationship. If you want to have a child, I mean, why take a risk? Go to the laboratory and, uh, and and produce yourself a child to your uh, to your liking. You know, check off the the boxes of which uh, which genetics you want, which genetics you don't want. So, so the question is, what do they do with the embryos, the excess embryos, or the embryos that's afflicted with Tay-Sachs? And we'll talk about that in a moment with respect to stem cell research. Uh, the answer is they discard them. And that's a, that's a halachic issue. Are you allowed to discard embryos? What is the status of the human embryo? And we'll get to that. We'll get to that in just a moment. So they um, they receive permission to undergo pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, um, and they're thinking to themselves, "We got this permission to do it. You know, we already have a girl. Uh, you know, you're going to be in the laboratory anyway. Uh, maybe you could choose us a boy." And we can fulfill our obligation to be fruitful and multiply and have one girl and have one boy. So are you allowed to do gender determination uh, in Jewish law or are you not? Um, now, there are different methods of doing gender determination. The one method is, is, uh, involves sperm sorting. Um, and in sperm sorting, it's not done by in vitro fertilization. They'll actually just obtain a, a specimen from the man. They send it to the laboratory, and they'll send you back two vials, one labeled X and one labeled Y. Maybe if somebody mentioned that's the male sperm that determines the sex of the child. And then you would use whichever one you want to artificially inseminate the woman when she's ovulating. You would simply use a pipette and inject the, uh, inject the specimen in the hopes of, uh, of conceiving. Um, detractors of this particular method from a scientific perspective say your odds of success with this are about 50-50. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want a more effective method, the more effective method is to use pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, but that involves harvesting the egg from the woman, fertilizing the embryo in the laboratory, which is a process, and a major expense. Um, and involves hormonal manipulation of the woman as well, not a simple matter. And then you can re put that embryo back into the, uh, into the woman, and the success of implantation is about uh, you know, 20 to 40 percent, depending you know, on which laboratory. Um, 
so, so can you do such a thing for, for, the, for the purpose of, of gender selection? Uh, now, there, there are interesting halachic reasons why some would want, want to do such a thing. So, for example, and these are real cases, these are not fictional cases. So, one we mentioned, one is to fulfill the obligation to be fruitful and multiply. One could say, I want to do gender selection for that purpose. Uh, but there's also an interesting case of a, uh, of a Kohen who, um, who required, who had complete infertility, uh, and had no no sperm of his own whatsoever. And when I say no sperm in this day and age, it's literally none, because they can actually do testicular biopsy and find one single sperm and directly implant it into an egg in a procedure called intracytoplasmic sperm injection. Um, and even immature sperm can be used for intracytoplasmic sperm injection. Fascinating technologies. So he had, uh, he had uh, infertility, male factor infertility, and he received permission to undergo artificial insemination using donor sperm. But then he asked the follow-up question and said, listen, I'm a Kohen. This child's not going to be related to me. If I have a son, it's going to be socially very awkward because the Kohen usually gets the first aliyah to the Torah. The Kohen goes up on the holidays uh, you know, to Duchen, and, uh, and uh, I won't be able to bring my son with me. And everybody's going to ask, you know, is this your son? Is this not your son? So can we, can we do gender selection and select a female child so it won't be socially awkward for me? Um, so there are halachic reasons why one would want to do gender selection. Generally, the, the halachic response is we don't advocate gender selection, and for sure we don't advocate uh, doing assisted reproduction for the sole express purpose of gender selection. How, for a couple that has no other medical problems and doesn't suffer from infertility. However, if they're already in the lab and they're already doing chromosomal analysis, some have allowed people to select genders. And, and there is actually one rabbi in Israel who has allowed people to prospectively, this is a, there's only one opinion, allowed people to prospectively undergo the process if they have at least five of one gender and they want to have one of the other. So the, this, the, the uh, ethical term is you know, family balancing. You know, the, uh, the Hebrew analog would be you know, be fruitful and multiply or pru or vu. But these are evolving technologies, yes. Correct. And the second one is in the Taysox case, there's a 50% probability of a uh, fertilized egg being a recessive for Taysox. So Excellent, excellent question. The question is, um, first of all, they have multiple eggs. That's, that's, that's correct. Anytime they do this procedure, they will harvest. They will induce ovulation. Usually a woman ovulates only one egg a month. What they will do is they will induce increased ovulation by, by hormonal manipulation. They'll harvest multiple eggs. It'll be variable amount. And then they'll, in, they'll inseminate or fertilize all those eggs. And then the question was, the child may not have Tay-Sachs, but the child may be a carrier for Tay-Sachs. So maybe one should say, let's select out not only the embryo that doesn't have Tay-Sachs disease, but I want a, an embryo that has no Tay-Sachs carrier whatsoever. And that was a, when the very first case of PGD was done, the uh, Yuri Verlinsky from Chicago, who's still on the frontier of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, was faced with this dilemma, and he decided not to make that distinction. He actually implanted the carrier. Um, but then you're running into uh, to real genetic manipulation, and, and literally, you know, the slope uh, goes, uh, goes pretty steep from there. You know, let's say, let's say you're, you're a carrier, and you, you don't even uh, only one of you is a carrier, and you want to have a child that's not a carrier. Can you have pre-implantation genetic diagnosis to prevent you from being a carrier? So right now, the answer to that would probably be no. But but it just it's just a testimony to to the uh, the dilemmas that we're going to be having in the near future. Yes. Healthiest in what sense? Okay. So of those six, you're not gonna you're not gonna necessarily put you know I guess potentially you could put the four four not gonna express you know express the gene or if you're only gonna do two, are you obligated to put in the two that have no T sex gene at all? Well the this is important the question is are you obligated to if you have 
uh, embryos that have no Tay-Sachs gene and embryos that have a Tay-Sachs gene, should you be obligated to put in the ones that have no Tay-Sachs gene? The answer to that is no. And the reason why that's a no is because an embryo with a Tay-Sachs gene and an embryo with no Tay-Sachs gene are no different in terms of their health. I suspect that there are a number of people in this room that are carriers for Tay-Sachs. You may not even know it. You are no less healthy than a person who is a non-carrier for Tay-Sachs. That's why, by the way, some people, we didn't discuss it at length, but this Dor Yasharim, they offer anonymous testing. The reason they offer anonymous testing is because in the ultra-Orthodox community, there is a concern that being a carrier for Tay-Sachs, even just a carrier, will be a stigma. But in the supposed enlightened community that we live in, we don't believe a carrier to be a stigma, but maybe we do too. Even though we tell ourselves that the carrier is not a stigma, we still say, well, if I had a choice between marrying somebody who's a carrier and who's not a carrier, you know, for my future generations, maybe I should marry somebody who's, uh, who's not a carrier. So it's very, very complicated. And we, and, and we erroneously believe that more information is better. And it's not always, it's not always the case. Um, I actually apologize. I'm just going to move forward. Yes. Yes, and I suspect we should do that before we end. We should talk about life. I think it's an excellent, uh, <laughs> and we'll get to that. We'll get to that right now. But just a comment on the, on the, on the Tay-Sachs. The, the question was uh, the perpetuation of the Tay-Sachs carrier status. And I apologize, apologize. The, 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 um, and the perpetuation of the carrier Tay-Sachs. Some have argued that the detractors of Dory Sharm say, you know, in the natural situation, the two carriers would occasionally marry. And then they wouldn't. It would. They, the children with the uh, with the with the gene would would tragically die. But at least the gene would be dying out with them. They wouldn't be perpetuating the carrier status by preventing carriers to marry. Doria Sharma is exponentially increasing the carrier status. So you have all these people that that could have married each other and then you know, would have stopped with them. Now you have all these people that are carriers that are passing on the carrier gene to their generations and their subsequent generations. And it's a, uh, I mean, it, it, I'm not explaining it so fully, but it requires further analysis, but they're definitely increasing the carrier state by virtue of what they're doing. And one could argue that maybe you should do the genetic testing to eliminate the carrier state, like you said. Right, right, but, but I don't think that, but that at this stage doesn't meet the rabbinic criteria of a threshold to perform PGD in order just to remove carrier status. And you could also argue because we can always test, even if we find that the person is a carrier, so we'll know later on that he shouldn't marry a carrier because we can always do a simple blood test to determine who's a carrier and who's not a carrier. But just in our final moments, I'll just get to the issue of uh, uh, this couple, uh, Yaakov and uh, Jacob and Leah, they, uh, they have extra embryos that they, uh, that they didn't use in their, in their process of uh, fertility and determining uh, gender determination, etc. And they read an article, uh, an ad in the paper that uh, they want embryos donated for stem cell research. Is it okay for them to donate their embryos to stem cell research or not? So the crux of the discussion with embryo, with stem cell research, and obviously in the interest of time, uh, you could well imagine just the science of stem cells is complicated. Um, but uh, I mean, actually, since I knew I was going to be here today, I, 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 uh, I actually brought some stem cells with me. And if you look over here, you'll see I have some stem cells over here, and some stem cells over here, and some stem cells over here. And the truth is, we all have stem cells. Everybody in this room has stem cells, but those are adult stem cells. Those are separate and distinct from the stem cells that President Bush, in his first speech, which everybody thought would define his presidency, uh, discussed. Um, and the, the stem cells that everybody's talking about are, uh, are stem cells that are harvested at an earlier embryological stage. Um, and they are, uh, they are different than the adult stem cells. And this stem cell can actually potentially, the stem cells that are harvested at uh, you know, a few days of, of, uh, of development of the embryo in the laboratory can theoretically grow into any organ system. Uh, they can go into hearts, livers, kidneys, lungs, uh, and why a particular cell becomes a kidney and another cell becomes a heart and another cell becomes a lung 
is one of the most extraordinary things in the world, and to study embryology and not believe in a greater power, I think, is, ex is extremely difficult. I cannot imagine how someone could study embryology and not to believe. Uh, it doesn't have to necessarily have to be the same God, but in a God, a greater power, I can't imagine. Uh, I can't imagine. Um, so the question is, to harvest these, em these stem cells from this uh, embryo, these so-called embryonic stem cells, which are thought to have tremendous potential in, uh, in, in a clinical application, one must perforce destroy the embryo. So then the question begs itself, what is the status of the human embryo? When does, quote, life begin in the eyes of Jewish law? So to answer that question, in our, in our concluding uh, analysis, well, there was a fascinating uh, debate, a fascinating case that, that occurred in Tel Aviv. And the, the case was a number of months ago of a, uh, of a laboratory whose uh, systems malfunctioned and tragically 500 embryos decomposed as a result. Of their, preser their preservation system malfunctioned. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to change the variables a little bit and say that this happened on the Sabbath, happened on Shabbos. And they run into the, the chief rabbi of Tel Aviv, and they say, Rabbi, we have to interrupt your davening, we have to interrupt your prayer. we got a serious dilemma here. we got 500 embryos that are about to decompose. Can we violate the Sabbath to preserve those embryos, or can we not violate the Sabbath to preserve those embryos? How many people think we can violate the uh, Sabbath to preserve the embryos? How many people think not? So the answer to this question will give us an indication of what the status of the embryo is in the eyes of the law. We'd mentioned earlier today that obviously if anybody in this room had a medical problem on, on Sabbath, there's no question you're allowed to violate the law, you know, except for the Cardinal Three in order to preserve their life. Why? What's the catchphrase which we've invoked multiple times? It's Bikuach Nefesh. It's, the, it's a soul. Bikuach Nefesh for the life of a soul, but what's considered a Nefesh? Therein lies the, 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 uh, the crux of the issue. So let me ask you the following question. If a woman is pregnant with a child who is seven months gestation, and she's fine, but her child, her fetus is at risk, are we allowed to violate Shabbos to preserve the fetus? Is a fetus considered a nefesh or not? So the Mishnah says, the Mishnah says that if a woman is having difficulty in labor, you are allowed, in its graphics, as you are allowed to dismember the fetus limb by limb in order to preserve the life of the mother. But the minute that fetus's head exits the birth canal, he can't touch it. And why not? Because the Mishnah says, Ein dochi nefesh mipne nefesh. Because now that, that fetus becomes a nefesh at the time that it exits the birth canal. Implication being, and this is a complex uh, discussion in the Talmud, but for simplification purposes, that once that child exits its nefesh, as long as it's in utero, it is not considered a full status human being. Maybe a sub nefesh, a pseudo nefesh, whatever you want to call it. But if you kill that, that fetus in utero, as we mentioned, you are not culpable of homicide. So if you take, and now there is a distinction in Jewish law between a 40 days gestation and non-40 days gestation, and, and, and there's legal analyses. But even a fetus less than 40 days gestation in the uterus, are you allowed, for that fetus, are you allowed to violate Shabbos or not? Because the Talmud says that that fetus is considered mere water. So the answer to both of those questions is yes, you are allowed to, allowed to violate the Sabbath, but not because the fetus is considered a nefesh, because the halacha is halalalav shabbat achat kadeshi yishmor shabbatot harbe. Translated means you violate one Sabbath in order that this fetus will grow up to be a human being which will be able to observe future Sabbaths. So you don't violate the Sabbath because it's an actual nefesh, you violate because it's a potential nefesh. So then we ask the question, we got this embryo sitting in the laboratory, what is its status? Are you allowed to violate the Sabbath for the embryo in the laboratory? The answer is absolutely not. Why not? Because even though it has genetic potential, it does not have halachic potential, because if this embryo is left undisturbed in the laboratory, what's going to happen to this embryo? It'll decompose. If a fetus is left undisturbed in the womb, what's going to happen? It grows. It grows into a human being.
So it does not meet the threshold for halachic potential that would allow for violation of Shabbos and is not considered, even, even the fetus in utero is not considered a full nefesh, all the more so the embryo sitting in the laboratory is not considered a full nefesh. Now people agree that it's not simply like a hair from your head or skin cells. It has greater status and sanctity than those. But, but with some limitations, the majority of rabbis would allow stem cell research because it is not considered a nefesh at this particular stage. And just to conclude our wonderful morning, and I thank you all for your, uh, for your discussions and contributions, we've covered from the past in the, with mummies and smallpox to organ donation to a little bit of genetics and assisted reproduction. In all these cases, I hope we have learned that the rabbis have addressed these issues with a greater understanding of medicine and science. And God willing, as we look to the future, they'll continue to do so for all the future developments in the, in the coming generations. Thank you. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.